Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things Meet Carly Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea you're listening to Jams and Tea Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast. We are doing a B-Sides episode today. We are here, the three of us, Tyler, Sarah, and I, are going to be talking about one of my personal favorite bands ever. One of the, like, premier legendary metal bands, that being the fucking incomparable death which as the name implies were some of the people at the forefront of the late 80s early 90s death metal movement and are often cited as the progenitors of this particular subgenre while not releasing the first death metal album they were sort of at the the the, the front as it were and one of the more popular uh bands to come about this yeah, yeah for... i do think it's funny though that the last time we were all together was the last b-sides on Laura Marling, Marling. Yeah. which pr- pretty pretty far away from Miss Marling, but I think it's important that we also establish um, this is an interesting sort of convalescence of people, I think, that we're getting to cover this today because we have me, who's sort of the, I, I guess I am like, you know, me and Morgan are the metal guys on the podcast, and I have a, a long history with this particular band. I've been listening to them like since I've been listening to music in general. And I have sort of Tyler who I sort of got into over the last couple of months, just sort of, you know, we pushed him to have his own sort of discovery. And then there's Sersha who's not like as experienced with varieties of metal, but also has sort of followed Tyler. So we get a variety of yeah. perspectives here on this death metal band today. Like I listened to Scream Bloody Gore last year and that was my first death record. But my second one was Sound of Perseverance, which I only listened to early january of this year yeah what yeah. a sea change between those two <laughs> the first thing oh, right. <laughs> like, i went through their uh, discography in chronological order so and and i think there's a that's um the best way to experience it and that's the way that we'll kind of be obviously we're going to be discussing their records and following the progression from one to the next um but yeah florida-based band uh, incredibly influential uh one of the pioneers of death metal and one of the most consistently ambitious and forward moving acts uh, in metal, generally speaking, a uh, number of classic records that we're excited I would to be discuss. willing to venture and say that maybe while not my personal favorite, that Death is a top contender for literally the most consistently impressive discography <laughs> of any band that has ever made music. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, seriously, like, that's not even a joke. Yeah. They're one of my favorite bands, almost purely by the fact that they are so consistently impressive. Yes, and and not we... to spoil my opinion too much, but out of the seven records, they have, I want to say four, that are immediately in, like, my top favorite records ever. Yes. And the others are still great. They, they are yeah. very well regarded by most people. That is not a controversial opinion that we have when we say that either, is that they their records are, like, monoliths in this genre. They are a big fucking deal. And when I say um, forward-thinking and ambitious... Um, death obviously charted an incredible um, journey from very primitive death metal in their early days to an incredibly uh, technical and, and style of progressive death metal uh, at their kind of peak and at their sort of in their final days as a band. And um, it's, it's kind of difficult to think of death as a band um, because really death is one man and his rotating <laughs> cast of various mm-hmm. incredibly talented musicians who will discuss and mention um, individually as we talk yes. about his record. But death is um, the late great Chuck Schuldiner, who is uh, an absolute, was an absolute force to be reckoned with as a personality mm-hmm. and as a writer. And it's, it's exciting and, and, thrilling to chart his the, his the development of his skill as a writer his interests the ways in which you get certain themes visited uh, on through much of his work but examined um in different ways through different lenses from different perspectives as um the discography goes on there is a lot of complexity and um detail and nuance to death that 
just casually listening to your records, you might not immediately appreciate. And so I, we are going to try and, and shed some light on that in our discussions as well. Um, but death have uh, a very kind of tight and consistent and straightforward discography, just seven records over the course of 11 years. Um, and they also, I believe, have some um, minor live releases and EPs, but basically I think yeah. all of their, the bulk, if not all of their original material uh, can be found on the records. Um, so, I mean, we'll just kick into it, I guess, with um, their very first album, uh, 1987's Scream Bloody Gore, uh, a, a, an absolutely pioneering uh, death metal record it's disputed as to whether it is the first death metal record but it is certainly one of the first and it certainly uh, represents the finessing of a particular style of metal um, or at least like the establishment of like the core uh, as tenets and aspects of it um, so it's and, and again it's very much uh, the Chuck Schuldiner show uh, on this record all of the guitar and bass is played by him uh, and you have uh, Chris Reefert behind the kit um, uh, the only death record that he would play on and that is a phrase you're going to hear quite a lot today yeah. <laughs> um, um, but yeah or one of the two records for most musicians that involved themselves with this band yeah yes yeah. so if you were lucky you got to stick around for a couple um, as one might expect, uh, this is a very kind of rudimentary and basic beginning for death, but though by no means is that uh, a criticism or even damning with faint praise. It sets a basic template that needed to be established and from which the band would blossom in exciting and progressive ways. It is a dark and a grueling record, but it also has a particularly kind of almost industrial tone in the spacious but hammering sound. Um, I, in my opinion, the absolute standout track, and I think the most exemplary and awesome example of this new and defined metal subgenre, as well as Schollner's particular talents as a metal composer, is Zombie Ritual, which is just ah, one of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, and ab absolutely, um, yeah, uh, disgusting piece of music. Uh, what do you mm -hmm. guys think of Scream Bloody Gore? What's your perspective on this record? I, well, I think. No, I, I think Zombie Ritual is like a great place to start to talk about this record um, because, uh, you know, the, a lot of the lyrics and ideas were really inspired by, by the kind of films I watch. Uh, really trashy Lucho Vulci films and both the sound and the lyrics of Zombie Ritual. But, I mean, it's called Zombie Ritual, and you know, Fulci is one of the. It best is an album with regurgitated guts, as one of the titles. Yeah. So that tells you um, almost yeah. everything you need to know. But listening to the record, you do feel like you're living in that that man's surreal, hellish brain. Like the scene in City of the Living Dead, where the girl vomits up her own intestines and then bleeds from the <laughs> eyes. Yeah. Um, yep. I think uh, what's what's particularly uh, interesting or notable about this record with regard to the others is there's a real kind of singular focus on that gore. Yeah. I mean, right down mm. to the title. Like on future, on their next couple of records, I think, um, or at least on the next one specifically, they would kind of, it would be sort of lyrically quite similar, but there would be kind of more apparent sort of layers to the writing and, and double meanings and kind of metaphors and stuff. Whereas here, I think it's very much just, it, I mean, there is obviously um, detail and nuance to the writing, but for the most part, the point is just to uh, embed you in the squalor and, and, and just to kind of overwhelm you with the sheer um, disgusting miasma of it all it's not yeah. necessarily about conveying particular meaning as far as i can tell it's it's just simply about kind of being as as dark and depraved as possible um the writing on this record is deliberately primitive uh, mm. uh Sheldoner, in a way that he doesn't really do on any other record he he revels in a particular kind of vulgarity and uh, the depiction of gory and torturous acts in the most blunt and straightforward manner possible. Like I'm pretty on, on 
later records when talking about the kind of violent or depraved acts there would be a kind of focus on the consequences on the the pain on the something on, emotional or political to frame these yeah, things exactly. like we're, a backdrop whereas here it is purely descriptive of in the moment uh, acts of violence um I think of um, from the track Sacrificial, uh, watch you bleed, yeah. watch you bleed to death, gasping for last breath, choking mm. on your blood. I shit into your guts, sacrificial <laughs> cunt. I despise. Um, yeah. So in many ways, this kind of bluntness, I think, recalls like early no wave records from bands like Swans, for instance. Yeah. In the sense that <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it exists not to shock you necessarily, but to numb you, to kind of overwhelm you with a hell world of endless depravity until it starts to feel normal. Uh, it's an exercise in the streamlining of person to person destruction making these kind of like most the most horrific things possible seem uh, plain and procedural it's it's really kind of like it's two-dimensional but that's to its benefit like that's the whole point mm-hmm. yeah but for me like there's something uh, Romero said about his own films where there is something political in just showing someone having their guts ripped out sometimes um in making that act of transgression it's like the metaphor is taking out what was once hidden inside um, which as chuck with- definitely yeah. i think shows because like his later career is so pointedly and and specifically about certain things that like i think it's difficult to argue that he was doing anything but what you just said on this very record like as yeah. a sort of like baseline for the band and the, their later career but also just like as an artistic statement like as a mm-hmm. as just a thing that he wanted to do rather than like board of limitations or just like a, a lack of talent or inspiration yeah like when you have on later records a song like uh, Pull the Plug, where the narrator is there pleading for death, um, there's less of that uh, feeling of um, I feel pain done to me. It, it is relishing in the act of the doing. Yes, um, yes. I also think the cover is really illustrative in my particular feeling listening to this record, because you have like the figure there who is disgusting but he has his other disgusting uh, lackeys there worshipping him and listening Just, to the record. Look, I, I this... want to cover myself in grease like Dennis Reynolds crawling out of a sofa and then get the, get down and worship the album. This album is this album cover is basically like this is us right now. This is me and the homies when we get the vaccine, <laughs> when the vaccine drops. Like that is exactly what this cover is. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I think that there's only really one thing that truly holds this back in my eyes. Like maybe if you don't really like the sort of like really primal um, animal sort of approach they have to the, to the writing here, which in this kind of metal, I don't know why that would be a problem for you. If it is, then (laughs) that's very strange. But I think the only like real problem this album faces is in fact the production, which is basically a double-edged sword in the sense that like it does really, really convey that sort of like sort of no wave feel of just the 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 raw bluntness and numbness of this kind of mix, just sort of, uh, it, it suits it in a weird way, but it's also a mix that's a little bit muddier. It's also a mix that like, it's it's lacking the, the punch, I think that say the following record, Leprosy undeniably contains and would probably benefit from the remastered version of this record does clear up a little bit that in some respects, but not enough in my opinion to truly like turn it or whatnot. But that said, I think that like, this is such a fan fucking tastic way to start off not only like a genre or just a band, but just like in general, it's such a consistently impressive album uh structurally uh i think too from like the songs like not even like an album level i mean like on a song by song basis this band was hitting it out of the fucking park since day one and uh you know it starts off with infernal death which sort of has this sort of trademarked uh death uh doomy serrating start and just kind of begins and just batters you with these ascending riffs and uh like the drums on this album and 
Throughout the entire course of the band's discography, I think the best way to describe the attitude towards the drumming was that the, whoever is drumming is trying to abuse their instrument. They are trying to hurt the drums. Uh, and as a result, it's awesome. Uh, the vocals here, which are sort of the trademark of the death metal movement, are the sort of the harsh, growling howl that Schuldner just like really really perfected out of the get-go and we see evolve over the course of their career but that's sort of the the main thing sort of infusing that harsh vocal styling with the sort of uh thrash metal that was popularized in the early to mid 80s and um and just like at the gate just it lets you know exactly what you're in for a uh, zombie ritual as tyler mentioned just opens with this great kind of power slave era Iron Maiden style guitar riff and the drums just sound fucking enormous. The gnarly bass work is front and center on this song. Every instrument gets a moment to shine in the opening minute until the track just kind of collapses in on itself. And like the minute and a half mark, the song just goes absolutely fucking ape shit. And it just sort of chugs along at the midway point, switching back and forth to more traditional death metal styling stuff and like, early motorhead and it's like structurally speaking they just keep shifting over and over and over again so that's like a lot of the construction of this might be primitive but the actual like sections of it specifically are so impressive especially when you string them together uh and i i think that it continues into this uh the third track you have sort of a great moment of sequencing of zombie ritual and denial of life which is another one of my favorite ones which is just fucking ruinous like the riff uh, it starts with is already throttling you at a hundred miles an hour. And then somehow the drums go even faster. And this song is just like, it's so dynamic and restless mm -hmm. and shows how even on their most primitive record, they were still just like absolutely trying to tear the fucking door down. And yeah, it's and like- it's really good to highlight, I think the fact that every song they make on every album changes what it is very frequently. Um, but on this record and the next record, especially, it it shifts. It's like a Rolls Royce shift in gears. You just don't feel it. Um, yeah, and it, and it feels it's so, so seamless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point to make. And like, it's not fully blown like progressive, but like the seeds of their evolution are here from the start. You can feel it. Uh, the guitar work around like a, a minute in is some like Judas Priest KK Downing shit. It's fucking rad. Uh, and this song just like doesn't let you breathe for a single second. Um, Sacrificial is like, you know, has this another doomy opening set of riffs. Uh, song yields a more like build around a slow progression. And then the guitars come in and it's right at a Ride the Lightning era Metallica and it sounds wicked. Uh, the song is just, it's fantastic. Um, even though I feel like the three tracks that precede Sacrificial are a little bit like, they just sort of do what this song does like a little bit better. Um, Mutilation has this caustic opening guitar line that feels like a live wire that if you touched it, it would electrocute and kill you. Regurgitated Guts uh, has this sort of uh, unrelenting groove that bursts apart into the central riff of the song. Um, and it does that sort of dynamic switch up thing that Sacrificial did, but like a little bit more of a visceral and interesting way. Um, Baptized in Blood has this fucking bass. Oh my God, from the very start, it's so goddamn disgusting, but like it's hard to pay attention to anything that isn't that until Chuck lets out this like thunderous bellow that's like super bone chilling and the drums go hard and like the it it, it kind of makes you realize that like a lot of bands they depend on the bass work to be like the sort of backbone of their sound and like flesh it out whereas death I think treats uh, the bass a little bit more like its own instrument and they do this more with the drums the drums are like the spine of this band and everything seems to be structured and built around them there's torn to pieces which has these lightning fast riffs very motorhead very early metallica and then there is my favorite song on the record which is evil dead which holy fucking yeah. shit dude like you know it's it's hard to like 
you, you go to an album like Symbolic or Sound of Perseverance mm -hmm. and you're just like, this is the pinnacle of music. I'm going to have a hard time going back to their earlier records because this is so good and so up there. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to their earlier records and you're like, uh, no, 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 wait a minute. No, they, yeah. they made some points and Evil Dead mm -hmm. makes some fucking points right out the gate with that fucking guitar tone, which is my, the my gnarliest first, thing my... I've ever heard. <laughs> My first note on Evil Dead is the opening feels like it's about to swallow you. It's it's <sighs> it's it's the metal guitar tone. This yeah. is this is the metal sound, and I I just it's it's peerless. If the entire album in one three minute span and like every instrument or every instrument here is operating at a 10 out of 10 level it's awe-inspiringly ferocious and like the the howling is a little bit more dynamic and the solo in the middle is where i see the face of god <laughs> and then there's the title track which is an absolutely fucking amazing song that ends off the record it's an extraordinary achievement uh it's mm -hmm. like viciously enjoyable i think maybe ending the album with evil dead might have been the stronger way to go just because i do feel like that is a more uh final song a song with more finality i guess but like to complain about the title track would be to uh undersell how just fucking insane and awesome it is and there's just there's such a a nicheness to this record there's such a uh uh, I, I won't say a charm because I almost feel like that belittles it because like it's it, it, it's just so out of the gate impressive and I've only grown to really love this album more and more even though it's like comparing this to say um, Sound of Perseverance would be like comparing Piper at the Gates of Dawn to Animals. It's just like, uh... But like, still, in its own way, it is. It, it fulfills a part of their sound that is is, is essential. You you cannot skip this album, yeah. no way. Um, I, I, you covered so many of my points. I just want to respond to like two things you said. Sure. One is uh, regarding the production, which is I agree. It it's it's a hindrance for me. It's still good, but the other records are just so much. Be like better mixed even, even the remaster doesn't quite get out there i think what they're going for is to kind of evoke that hazy dreamlike setting of so many of the projects they're evoking where the like the violence isn't violence it's it's a surreal tone where anything could happen and they're trying to evoke that kind of hazy muddy uh feeling of living in a a nightmare but it, it yeah. means that just it comes through less crisply than the other records, I think. I think um, I think with regard to the production, I mean, I would agree, but I would say it's um, more a reflection of the sense in which this was truly just like a a, a very burgeoning genre. Like mm -hmm. this is this was the beginning. This was the template, and and this was sort of kind of just establishing the roots, so that you would have more time. There would be more uh chances to kind of finesse the sound including the production on future records and i think that is reflected as jake's already said in the immense sort of level up that um leprosy is even just in terms of production alone um mm -hmm. yeah there's a rudimentary quality to to every kind of aspect of of the sound of this record um that i think definitely it, it, it could sound better um, and I would probably uh, like it more if it did. But on the other side of the coin, it's kind of like the rudimentary quality kind of enhances the yeah. value it has as a kind of relic of a very specific time and a kind of double edged um, sword. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 yeah. Like it's that. just mainly yeah. something to keep in mind when you explore this album because it's yeah, like you know it, it may be more of a helper hindrance i would also argue though that like while it's not like i i think the production is is overall you know it's 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 good but with several caveats but i do not think it is the weakest production on a death album which i don't think that even then you could call it bad production but there is just a specific album that we will get to where it lets parts of the instrumentation down just a little tiny tiny bit in a way that this doesn't really interesting i yeah I, I think i know which one you're talking about i i, I definitely don't agree i think this is comfortably the weakest um sound that's still record. understandable but uh i'm interested to see where we go with that 
Yeah, the other thing I just wanted to note is you are incredibly right to highlight Chuck's uh, vocals, which are a highlight on every death record, yes. on every song. He is constantly bringing his A-game. And also, um, record to record, his vocals can do very different, can serve very different purposes. Like um, on some, like the whole time, it sounds like he's like ill, you know? Um, yep. And on others, uh, he's... Like on the cover, the Judas Priest cover on Standard Perseverance, it sounds like he is reaching levels of yeah, bro. Uh, yeah. We'll Lately, get onto that. Yeah, but, let's try um, not to look ahead too much. But yeah. I know, I know, I know. But I'm, but yeah, the vocals are always doing really interesting things, and it's just you have to acknowledge that right out the gate. Yeah, I think it's just a testament to the fact that he was constantly evolved. I mean, obviously, Death were a band that were known for constantly evolving, and that is true in every respect. And Chuck was always constantly evolving his sound as a vocalist, and you hear and and adjusting very specific kind of aspects of his tonality and his um, uh, very and like the just the qualities of the way that he screams and growls to reflects it, the, the it gets matter. to a point where he sounds like a completely different person on some albums like the ability yeah. his, he would the dynamic range he had was basically peerless and we'll get to that but okay yeah. um i sh- i think we should wrap up um screen bloody yeah. door and talk about list our favorite tracks if least mm-hmm. favorite track if we have one and mm-hmm. uh, a general rating for this record yeah um, jake why don't you go first uh my three favorite tracks in order Evil Dead, Denial of Life, and Zombie Ritual. Least favorite track, um, which is still a very good song, I would say is Sacrificial. And I'm giving the album an 8.5 out of 10. Neat. Um, My favorite tracks are, I'm going to say Zombie Ritual and Evil Dead and Denial of Life. Uh, I'm not feeling a least favorite track, although I probably have one. Um, I'm going to give this 8.5 as well. Well, uh, my three favorite tracks, uh, <laughs> this is going to be a bit, a bit repetitive. Uh, my three favorite <laughs> tracks are Zombie Ritual, Denial of Life, and Evil Dead. Well, let's uh, fucking go. Uh, least favorite, <laughs> if I had to pick one, I would pick Two Under Pieces. And 8.5 out of 10 is also what Damn. I wrote down. <laughs> Crazy. Damn. We uh, did not confer with each other no. at all about these records beforehand. So well, that's really shockingly, cool. that's 8.5 on average. <gasps> yes. Uh, don't, which is, is the first uh, time that's like ever happened with more than two people? I Maybe. think so. Um, and uh, this is equivalent to albums like Spirit World Field Guide, Reinventing Axel Rose, I Speak Because I Can, and Dance Music, and also the Verve EP. Damn, Love all right. It. It's very so. much the reinventing Axel Rose and the Verb EP of, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, they're very comparable in terms of placement and careers. Yep. Um, okay, so we, we move then, on. We then move forward to uh, Leprosy. Leprosy, which was released the very next year, uh, 1988. Uh, it is immediately a fuller sounding and more ambitious record than Scream Bloody Gore. In fact, I would say uh, the leap is substantial, maybe one of the greatest leaps between two consecutive records in this discography. Uh, notable uh, lineup changes. Um, drummer Chris Reifert is replaced behind the kits with Bill Andrews, uh, whose drumming instantly, I think, has more presence and dissonant loudness uh Mm -hmm. it's a very slamming pummeling drum sound um and i would and also the excellent sound of leprosy i think is in no small part due to legendary producer scott burns who would go on to engineer important records for bands in death metal and related subgenres such as obituary sepultura coroner terrorizer suffocation deicide gore guts cynic cannibal corpse and of course, the next three death albums. Um, so check out Coroner; they're also very good. Indeed. So um, yeah. So having uh, a producer behind the kit, uh, behind the boards, I should say, who has l- perhaps more vision and perhaps more finesse, and would go on to have an incredibly successful career, I think, is reflected in the sound of this record. Um, and, and you get a, in terms of actual content, you get a development of a lot of the lyrical themes of the first record. 
um, more and more of Chuck's interests in pestilence, suffering, and human degradation are immediately on display in the title track, which opens the record and imagines in visceral <laughs> and disgusting detail the suffering of lepers who decompose while alive, rotting while they breathe, dying in slow agony. There's it's again very kind of similar to the kind of process of suffering that you was explored on screen bloody gore but there's almost a more uh existential quality to it here um that i think adds quite a bit uh even though it's a subtle difference uh in terms of um the guitars uh Schuldiner, who obviously performed all the guitar parts on the first record shares lead duties with guitarist rick ros who actually um composed the track primitive ways um, and uh, helped with the writing on most of the other tracks as well. Uh, instrumentally, anyway, um, the lyric, lyrical writing was 100% shoulder, as it always is. Um, I think you get one of the greatest death tracks on this record, on this record, which is Pull the Plug. Mm. Uh, the chugging riffs of the chorus are pure death brutality, but the wriggly melodies that take over from there are completely unpredictable and just stunningly wicked. Um, the song is a melodic and a compositional masterpiece, a total fucking flex and just light years ahead of anything on the first record, not to disparage that record, but this track in particular and, and plenty of others on this record, I think are exemplary of the ways in which um, Schuldiner was kind of tapping into some kind of uh, incredible creative energy that was pushing him higher and higher at such an incredible speed um while retaining the same focus on morbid interests i think there's also a more emotional variation and nuance in the writing here compared to scream bloody gore uh, for instance you have a song like forgotten past which imagines a retired killer experiencing lost memories of long ago butcherings flooding back to him in a quite dramatic fashion. Uh, Left to Die is quite important in terms of signaling Sheld where Sheldon's uh, lyrical interests would go from here. It hints at the political undertones of his writing, uh, which obviously would come to the fore in a big way on the very next death record. And you're in this song, you're thrown into the perspective of a soldier experiencing traumatic bloodshed in real time and facing the hopeless certainty of a horrific death the use of second person perspective which you get across most death songs ensures the listener is at the center of the stories has absolutely no control or agency everything is happening not to um not to chuck who is orchestrating these um scenarios but to you the listener who is experiencing them that's i think a big part of what makes especially in the early um eras um, death's music so impactful as this notion of you being subjected to all of these things through the writing style um, uh, the frenzied solo in the final seconds of this song it sounds truly torturous it's like an urgent final screech as you're kind of dying on the battlefield and then you get uh, more complicated lyrical interests also explored in a track like Open Casket in which Schuldiner contemplates the nature of death uh, how we perceive it and the terror that comes from knowing you'll never properly understand it until you're in its grip. Again, leaning more into the existential side of death rather than just the banality of it. It's um, a really fascinating uh, record. I'm curious to hear what uh, you guys think about it. It's funny you mention it. Open Casket's actually my favorite song on the album. Uh, I think it's nice. interesting that like, I think you can probably compare this if their first album is their kill them all this album is absolutely their ride the lightning um it's it's just everything that was on the last record is here and it's better and you know not to dissuade scream bloody gore like that album still does have like a succinct purpose even though this is a big refinement of it like i still go back to it and enjoy it but leprosy here um this was my favorite death album for a, a long time and it was because this album is just a little bit it's less forwardly progressive than everything that came after it basically which means that it's a little bit more accessible to the untrained ears that i listened to this band with all these years ago and was just like i i had like trained myself on like 
like shit like Metallica and Motorhead. And this was way more comparable to, than something like Sound of Perseverance or Symbolic was. Um, so this was just easier to like latch onto, but it was also just such a notable step up compositionally. I think the most noted sort of improvement here is that like structurally, all of the songs are basically exactly like they were on Screen Bloody Gore and that they just sort of ebb and flow wherever they want to. And, but the difference here is that the actual instrumental presence within these structures is so much more dynamic. It's more full, it's more impactful. The mix is immediately louder. It viciously beats you for the entire 39 minute runtime, which is also like every death album is with, you know, one notable exception I think is like, pretty lean all things considered and i think that all of them even the longer one well longer uh truly benefit from its length um uh this obviously being no exception i think that the opener leprosy as tyler said is just already a step up uh it's less muddy it's more impactful uh, there's a weight here that even scream bloody gore's best moments just don't quite have um the growling is more menacing and and full of character. The the guitars sort of buzz to life here. It's it's euphoric. Um, one of the greatest moments in the band's entire discography happens with the guitar soloing near the end of the second third of the opening track, um, which they they don't screech or scream. They fucking wail in agony, and it's the coolest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, like, the soloing and guitar work on the previous record was nothing to sneeze at, but here, there is a distinctly more virtuosic display when it comes to the raw playing and soloing. It's it's just so impressive. Um, like, Born Dead rolls to life with surging breakneck rifts. Um, uh, I think, you know, the writing, I, I won't say that on this album specifically, it won't exactly win a Pulitzer, but it's definitely clear <laughs> that Chuck wanted to explore topics that went beyond the B-movie gore-centric lyrics of the debut. Leprosy explores more macabre and morbid topics that, while I would struggle to call them deep, definitely get at a distinct sense of human, societal, and moral rot that Chuck would explore deeper on every record that followed. Uh, the scorching guitars that come to life on Born Dead in the second half, just like the first, uh, show off some incredible soloing. Um, for a guy Forgotten Past features the songwriting being a little bit more distinctly hooky. I'm never ever going to just forget images of the forgotten past. It's fuck. Oh my god, I fucking like I Morgan and I put on this song when I bought the CD like two years ago in the car and we just fucking screamed along to this. And it's a it's a demolishing song. It has this robust guitar solo and it's great. Uh Left to Die is one of my favorite tracks on here. There's the there's a sexy guitar line that becomes positively filthy once Chuck began screaming and it sounds like a demon and it's uh, the lyrics of reality is what you feel as he describes the main character, you confronting the horror of death and agonizing detail. Uh, it's caustic and the progression of the song takes uh, itself along led by the drums uh, in a first showcase or not a first showcase, but a showcase uh, in the first third of everything that makes Leprosy a, a fantastic display of talent on all fronts. Uh, Pull the Plug, as mentioned, a fantastic fucking song. Um, I, I think the guitar work I could only describe here as in all capital letters, stupid. Cause I mean, like it, it's just a flex. It's, it, it feels almost excessive in how brilliantly, blisteringly brutal it is. And I have to, um, uh, also mention, particularly on Pull the Plug, Bill Andrews showing his incredible contribution to the band on here, epitomized by his unrelenting display of uh, virtuosic uh, drumming, uh, making it all the more baffling that he only uh, drummed on a total of four studio albums in his entire career, which I just think is like, damn man, really? Okay. But like, and, and the guitar solo in the second half is like, 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 like fuck off. This is annoying. This is a this is a this is too much, but also please keep doing it. Um open casket is probably 
uh, with maybe one exception on a song that we will cover on the next album. Maybe what I consider to be the absolute pinnacle of what we get from the early stages of death, where it's just like they're more balancing that death thrash sound. This is the epitome of that for me. The the drums aren't battered. They're, they're, they, they sound like they're about to come apart. The switch up to the slower, heavier part of the song where the drum becomes like a fucking machine gun and Chuck is just screaming and howling like a fucking animal. It's a it's a feat of mixing a metal song. The guitar soloing is con in contention for as impressive as it ever would be through their entire career as a band, which it, it's manic and feverish and panic and huge. And it's, it's, it's intent is solely to pummel you and it fucking does it. Uh, and even lyrically, this song is about the uncomfortable and terrifying reality of death and how it dehumanizes those who have parted, turning once living people into objects, all with the same destination, a casket where they become a cold corpse. Uh, primitive ways, uh, in essence, does not stop ferociously beating the listener until it ends, making its four minute long torture chamber of musical pain. Thankfully, I'm a masochist, which is why I like this band. And there are several moments here where the guitar will like let up for a few seconds and then turn to something more funky and groove laden. And it's just mm. fucking amazing how this late into the album, it's throwing you curveballs. And then Choke On It, which is a stunning closer. It just throttles and whips and bangs and punches every single instrument, turn to 11. Chuck's vocals here are mixed to sound echoed, tightness and the song itself just crackles with youthful energy that can only come from young musicians who are as talented as they are ambitious. The scream at the center of the song uh, and, and the way it serves as like a highlight reel for every impeccable moment on this album. And it just, it, it, it fucking, it doesn't stop. And like uh, on the, the, the final line on the, the album, is a uh, choke on it, death is all around are the final lines. And it's like, there's no more fitting closer to an album as single-minded in its intention than this one. The great thing about that closing line is that you do feel uh, entombed by the band Death who do feel all around you. Yeah, And um, the, the lineup of this band shares members with the metal band Entombed. Hey, hey. Um, if there's a way of describing uh, Death Record, it's probably also the name of a death metal band. Um, right. just, as, just as a... Oh, yeah, as yeah. As yeah. Um, That's, it, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I was just going to add to that that I think um, Choke On is a great closer. I didn't mention it, mm -hmm. but it's a great way of ending the album in the sense that it's a song about kind of like suffocation and kind of like losing air mm -hmm. and like dying in the most painful way possible. Mm -hmm. And like they really yep. kind of give you that sense of like having the air kind of sucked out of the room you're sitting in, mm -hmm. and that slow death. And it's it's really uh, just an awesome way to end a record. Yeah, I, I wrote down the lyrics: uh, "Screaming fills your frenzied mind. No way out. No more time." Um, just yep. insanely scary. Um, it's a song that is like much as a fine line between like the like the fun kind of evil and absolutely punishing um <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I think uh, that's a really good descriptor uh thank you um but no um this for me is the moment that like death like arrive as, as like a formed force of nature yep um it, it, it somehow there are three death albums i like more than this I know, uh, right? It's just like, yeah. I, I, I feel like I need to vomit praise on this album because it's like not very high in my ranking and I still fucking love it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that this, like, I knew that I would love this album and exactly what I would love about this album. 10 seconds into the opening track. Because um, it, it comes in and the way they use the, the bell function on the ride symbol is it's like constantly whipping you with the sound of it um and it's very well it's not polyrhythmic but it's very syncopated and it it changes whether it's going to be on the beat or off the beat and the whole time on the song the drumming just exists to be unpredictable and catch you off guard with um the way it's used and the snare is so loud um yeah. it's it's incredible that's the um, and, biggest, yeah. I think that's my favorite instrumental detail of this record is just the way yeah. the, drum, the way the drums are mic'd and obviously the way that Bill Andrews is playing them to have this particularly kind of like 
uh, mm. like sheet metal quality of just like pure hammering slicing in your ears it's really something else like battering a mattress with a lead pipe in an abandoned factory yeah. that's what it sounds <laughs> such, like such a good way to put it, <laughs> it the, like the thing is is that that is like synecdoche for what's great about the whole record in that um well a it's just more professionally put together like the mixing is crisper the instruments are all better represented but at the same time the ways that they achieve the death effect are just so much more creative across the board and they're already really creative but they've just looked at what they've done and um kept it and just try to find new ways to do it um that is true on every song um i really appreciate the narrative step forwards he's the lyrics have taken just in terms of like uh, the range of the kind of stories he tells, even though they're still all incredibly violent. Um, but like I said, um, something like Pull the Plug has like actual like emotional depth to it. Um, and like a character who has like human responses that feel like detailed in ways that feel like a, like a person, like the, the chorus, and memories are all that's left behind as I lay and wait to die. I hear the choice of life. And that the thing that's really torturing him is overhearing people deciding to keep him alive. And that, um, that is, and that's kind of like you would get that theme fleshed out and developed more on a on a future track like Suicide Machine, for instance. Yes, um, that's exactly is, what I was thinking of. Which deals with the same sort of thing, that idea of like end of life choice, but it's much more kind of primitive and primal and 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 like it's it's still like dealing with the choice in this song, but there's more layers to Chuck's interest in the topic when he gets to it on, on a record like human, which obviously don't want to talk about future records to, in advance too much, but just a connection that we'll, we'll come back to. Yeah, sure. Like the leprosy at this point is the longest. Uh, if you were to line up all of their songs in chrono chronological and then album track order, leprosy would be the longest song up until that point. It's the most sort of epic and the most structurally complex. And then it's straight into Born Dead, which is just three minutes of the hardest shit you've ever heard. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, it feels like, whereas on the last one, they have a song that's long enough where they can make the rhythm about being unpredictable and flesh it out in ways that take good time to explore like that. In Born Dead, the rhythm exists to beat you and pummel you down. And it's just done incredibly me, well. Daddy Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, forgotten past chugs like the truck from Duel. Um, <laughs> I love that. Ah, uh, God, yeah. Um, and I love the lyrics dealing with uncovering forgotten evils, which we've sort of already touched on, being a lyrical theme. Mm. Um, yeah, and the drumming it make it it doesn't make me feel pummeled or scared. It makes me feel hollowed out, like someone yeah. has sort of poured acid down me, and now there's nothing left inside. Yeah. Um, it's just incredible. Left to Die is great. Uh, open Caskets, Great and Primitive Wings is great, but the closer choke on it is excellent. You've already touched on why those other songs are great. Um, I love this record so much, and I'm so excited to talk about it, and I'm really glad to have done this episode so I had a reason to listen to it. Yeah. It's just great. Yeah, it's just... Um... <sighs> This is like, uh, the way I think of it is like Scream Bloody Gore is the template and and this is the record where they kind of assume the identity of death, like they mm -hmm. really separate themselves here and and I think they continue to build on the notion of what death, the band is um, from re release to release. Um, so okay, let's um, wrap it up then and what at least talk about our three favorite tracks and ratings for this record. Yep. Uh, I will go first. This time, my three favorite tracks are Leprosy, Pull the Plug, and Open Casket. Uh, least favorite track, if I had to pick one, would be Primitive Ways. Uh, and I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. We're doing the thing again. Yeah. Where we yeah, the yeah, we are. <laughs> we probably are. Um, my favorite tracks are Leprosy, Born Dead, and choke on it probably uh, I don't really feel like giving a least favorite track again I, I don't think I'm going to do that today to be honest I don't know, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of albums where I don't don't worry yeah and I'm also going to get this record a nine and a half out of ten uh, my three favorite tracks are <laughs> open casket leprosy and left to die 
uh, least favorite track. I also just don't really have one, and I am also giving it a 9.5 out of 10. Mad lads, uh, mad lads. Fucking funny. <laughs> All right. So, All right. Um, we well, just, yeah, I just oh, want to got an air average of 9.5. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 9.5 yeah. with Ohm's Diamond Eyes Mushroom Puppets. Oh my God, that's perfect. Isn't it just amazing? A um, bit. So, we move forward again into the 1990s um, with the third death record, Spiritual Healing. Um, so this is generally regarded as the weakest death record by general yeah. audiences. But I, I mean, I don't really think that's the best way to approach it or even conceptualize no. it. If you, even if you think of it as the weakest death record, it's not really a good way to think of it because I think it's still I, a great I album. do. It, it's just like you're you basically you're right. You're underselling it if you say it's the weakest death album because there's so much that makes it unique still. Yes, uh, it, it is much more overtly melodic and even friendly. I and I use in, in um, inverted commas as um, close as they get. Uh, relatively speaking, and I think it's due likely to the presence of another, yet another new guitarist, James <laughs> Murphy, uh, not of LCD Sound System. Uh, <laughs> Darn. Who played only on this record. Uh, we have bassist Terry Butler um, giving the rhythm section more heft on this record, though I have to say I didn't find his parts especially prominent. Um, and you have Bill Andrews back behind the kits again for the second uh, time. Um, thematically, this is notable for being a significant topical and lyrical, I, I want to say pivot. Very much so. Um, for Schuldiner, there's certainly obviously vague hints of some of the stuff he touches on in previous, uh, or in Leprosy specifically, um, but this is very much a much more um, thematically focused record. Uh, it moves away from the focus on gore and explicit fantasies of flesh and feasting and decomposing and rotting in the pure abstract. And here, Schuldiner takes on more topical, political, and societal themes. The album cover uh, makes this pretty explicit, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to shout out as well, um, the first three um, death album covers are painted by uh, the great Ed Repka, who's a fantastic graphic artist who has um, created art for a number of um, great sort of metal bands, including probably most famously the cover art for Megadeth's Peace Sells But Who's Buying oh. and, and Rust yeah, in Peace. I, I thought if you'd have asked me to guess a record that was done by the same person who'd done these, I, yep. I would have guessed that one. Uh, yeah, it's got but, that but, same skull looking man. Yeah, so, um, and I, I do want to shout out that particular um, art style of the first three Death album yeah. covers because I think they're all iconic covers in their own way. And obviously, we touched on the Screen Blood Eagle one. And this cover, I think, is, um, I, I could see maybe not caring for it, but I actually think it's really endearing and kind of. No, I like it. And it's, it's yeah, obviously, it's got fucking Reagan on it. So it's like, yeah. Very, <laughs> it's very bald faced but it, it i think it suits the tone of the record really well mm -hmm. um uh, and and yeah an opener uh living monstrosity i think wastes no time delving into uh Schuldiner's perception of an america ridden with pestilence uh, leaving it's forgotten to wallow in hopeless drug addiction to numb the days um the track altering the future takes on or takes on is not really the right way of framing it but looks at the issue of abortion um but Schuldiner craftily avoids taking a, an active stance on a, the kind of ethical or moral question and is more kind of fascinated with just um the topic itself um the act. the balance of the sides of the issue i think is the way of he looks yeah, at it there like, and, and like the mundanity of the way in which this is an example of the taking of life in, in inverted quotes in a mundane everyday sense um mm -hmm. uh, if anything Schuldner is so careful not to fall on a particular side with regard to the issue that his examination might seem a little facile but if anything i think it just is more true to his interest in the process rather than um and if you know anything about the guy chuck chuck was was not uh pro-life yeah. and, and that's the <laughs> thing like he does get on on uh, subsequent records, I think he does get much more overt in terms of his perspective on yeah. these kinds of issues. And he does get more concerned with things like morality and right versus wrong. 
Uh, obviously, that's a concern on this record too, but um, I think it's kind of not on this particular track anyway. More of himself in the later records, I think. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Schuldiner has a curious examination or, or it seemingly plays with multiple personality disorder in the song Defensive Personalities. Yeah. Um, but I think this is kind of, I think if you read it as a track about that, it's a little hollow, but I think it's more interesting when you consider it a metaphor for various social masks, the ways in which Schuldner perceives yeah. people adopting personalities or beliefs, depending on how they can most benefit from a situation, um, tying into yes. the kind of um, broader political uh, interests of the record. Um and, and obviously the direct allusions to kind of like Reagan slash Bush era America on the album art. Um, the riffage and the pummeling melodic loudness is both more polished and punishing than ever. And I think it serves the music well. Um, the title track is uh, a very important song in the, in the death catalog. I would say it examines the theme of religion, uh, which obviously is the most overt um, theme of the album art and specifically focuses on murdering in the name of a god. Um, the soloing on this track is astonishing. It's colorful and ballistic. It's pure god mode shredding with great tonal range and dense layering that shows the band's ambition plainly and clearly. I adore the riffage here. It's, it's addictive and fast paced and dynamic and just outstanding. I genuinely think this is one of the band's best songs ever. Um, low life goes after shallow materialism it has this really doomy riff just over a minute in and these harrowing screams from Schuldner that shriek across the stereo mix again Scott Burns I think absolutely nails the placement of everything in all of these songs um, and yeah there's some more issues that are touched on as well but I will leave some stuff for you guys to talk about um Saoirse um since you've yeah. kind of gone last talking about the last couple of records I'm curious what you think about this particular yeah. record and what your take is so I like this record very much it, it, it is my least favorite death record but I do like it very much um which anyway <laughs> uh living monstrosity opens really well um it throws you right into it i just when he growls be born addicted to cocaine <laughs> i feel like that's to cocaine the way he delivers it is kind of funny but it's also a little bit, like, bleak, little bit. You know? but it's, I kind, love, of a, it's uh, kind of a yeah. meme line i think um when yeah. i think of mm -hmm. like chuck lyrics that one often comes to mind and it's not necessarily for the best of reasons no, 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 but I think he there is like a very obvious self awareness to the especially early death, I think. Yeah, totally. Mm. Um, and I can't imagine he didn't write that line with an awareness of how outrageous it is, um, and potential and it, that it could potentially elicit that response. Um, but the song in general just shreds, uh, it's a really blistering opener, um, altering the future, um more of the same a uh, very explicit political commentary but i find the instrumentation absolutely thrilling on this song um and again within the mind is another highlight the way that the uh, vocal flow interplays with the guitars and drums it just absolutely comes to life um for me um and the the opening riff is great i love the way the guitars feel like they slide up and down the neck it's really sort of beautiful in a way um uh, the title track you've already touched on is wonderful, but I, I want to touch on Killing Spree, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, get, I get big, like, American Psycho vibes off of this song. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, the way that it explores, like, deranged mentality and illusion whilst being, like, a yuppie murdering people. Um, it's, it's just great. I think the thing that Agreed. holds me back on this record though, is one of the, my greatest joys with the previous records was um, what I said earlier about, it feels like a Rolls Royce changing gears when it goes between sections. In this, when that happens, it, it does feel more cumbersome to me. And because they do it so much, it can get a bit grating sometimes. And even though each section is really great, I, I don't really want to start it feeling sort of like, like, like uh, I hadn't put my clutch in all the way when changing a gear, and um, but 
that's a real nitpick. But you kind of have to when you have to justify why something is your least favorite death record because they're all really good. Um, but no, I I really enjoy this record very much, and I I actually think even though the political commentary is much sharper on future records, I really appreciate its presence here, yeah. um, and I think the attempts he makes are you know worthy in and of themselves, and occasionally very uh, and and occasionally fulfill the totality of the of that potential i think but not, i think what it comes down to for me is I, I mean i don't think that this there's any kind of for me i don't find any any kind of musical uh, or compositional weakness in any of these songs i think for me the reason this is the lower tier death record is purely for the fact that the subject matter is more n nuanced in its exploration in later records and 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 i think has more layers to it and kind of uh relates the political and the personal and the psychological more effectively on later death records i think it's 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 more that i mean this record often gets accused of being a transitional album which is kind of a painful thing to be accused of because it's kind of like it's it's just kind of like you're immediately um sort of denying or or negating the things it does by virtue of the fact that the eras that it straddles on either side of it are just so much better and i think that's also uh, an unfair uh issue that perhaps individual thought patterns also gets in terms of public perception just because it's surrounded by I these two that. totemic records mm -hmm. um and i don't find um spiritual healing really in any way to be necessarily uh weak I just think that it's one of those examples of um, Schuldiner kind of cutting his teeth in a particular, like, again, the writing style is so different. You've moved away from gore and, and, and really kind of like yucky, disgusting stuff and more into stuff that has more chew on, so to speak. And um, it's more that the, the finesse isn't quite there yet, but that's really it. I think that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. It's funny, you you actually both brought up things uh, in terms of like negative perceptions that I do actually want to touch on. Uh, one of them being, uh, I, m my complaint with the album is that it is in fact transitionary, but I agree in the way that a lot of people view it as transitionary and they see that as a bad thing. The only thing about spiritual healing for me is that it's transitionary and it suffers from that. Um, because uh, like it's not inherently a bad thing because honestly I do agree individual thought patterns is a th record we will cover later that is very transitionary except I don't think that album suffers because of it um the the, the things that I have that are wrong with this album though are pretty definitive um there Tyler did allude to the fact that it's like it does have a lot of stuff that is a little bit more nuanced that's uh, commented on later in a way that's just more distinctly uh of the band it's a little bit less uh broad I think but even then this still has its charm in the same way that Scream Bloody Gore did in kind of a way um but the one thing is that I do think this is the weakest production on a death album and I don't even mean that in the sense that it's bad I mean that in the sense that it is like Scream Bloody Gore a double-edged sword where the things that make it good make it really good but the things that make it bad do let it down more than that album for me mainly notably in how the drumming is mixed I don't particularly care for it it's not all the time it's really really present for me on the first three tracks there's something about it that feels distinctly a little bit muddier that feels maybe a little bit like and occasionally the playing even kind of feels comparatively stiff especially when you compare it to that of leprosy which is strange to me because it's the same drummer as leprosy but there are just moments where like Sarah just said where there are like structural changes in the songs where it can come off as a bit more as she said cumbersome um and it, it does sort of do that for me but these are all things that only really make themselves present because they are things that i just don't have a problem with on other albums of theirs uh to say that it's anything less than great i think does it a a damn disservice um because i do think that uh like uh, i'll 
just back up what Tyler said about the title track, Spiritual Healing. My first fucking note about this is literally just all caps, ah, oh, fuck, the guitar on this is so sexy. <laughs> um, like, goddamn, this song sounds stupid good. None of my complaints with the production are present here. Uh, the bass playing here is so subtle, but adds this incredible layer of menace to the guitar here. And it's a song that Chuck's directly calling out the sort of exploitation, the exploitation that men with power, both political and religious, have uh, condemning their hypocrisy and cruelty and how they failed the institutions that they're supposed to protect. Uh, it's ambitious as anything on the last record musically, uh, and it's as scathing as they get when it comes to their lyrical content. And the middle of this song and the production on both the vocals and guitars is the first real genuine gesture at a more progressive sound, and it really, really works here. There are a lot of moments scattered throughout this album where you'll hear moments that were built on, uh, notably with human, where there's sort of like a layering thing or like a harmony thing that they do that's just like really, really creative. And like, I'm if I had been alive when these albums were coming out, this is the kind of thing that I'd want them to capitalize on, and they did. Um, but yeah, I will say the first three tracks are, uh, they're, they're good, but that sort of drumming problem I do have with it. Um, it's a tighter, more controlled, reined in iteration of the band's sound. Uh, the unhinged rhythmic insanity is traded in for a more tight, compact groove uh, that was present before, but is now taking center stage. Uh, the, the writing, of course, being more topical, political at the time. Chuck was not a fan of Mr. Ronald Reagan, had some thoughts about that. Um, but the ascending and descending guitar riff at the center of this track is nothing short of show-stopping. Um, uh, altering the future, again, we have this sort of quintessential doomy death intro that feels apocalyptic uh, from the first lyrical passage, uh, creating a life only to destroy, saved from a life of the unemployed, where crime is the only way to survive, which is, which is the best to be dead or alive. We see the intent of the album right away, and it's also just kind of unfortunate that this particular lyrical passage is aged particularly well, sadly. Um, uh, the solo here is vicious, the bass playing in particular is terrific. Um, just a, a, a perfect encapsulation of all the good things about this album. Defensive Personalities, as Tyler pointed out, it's a really fascinating song that I think is about the various ways in which we compartmentalize our brains and put on shows or displays of specific personality traits or characters uh, in order to cope with certain different difficult aspects of life and how we can lose ourselves in that. Uh, it's a song that becomes truly adventurous with the middle of its anguished guitar solos that sound impossibly menacing. Uh, within the mind, I want to shout out, uh, opens up with a fantastic guitar line uh, and just the, the production, I feel, takes a notable step up with the drums. Uh, they're crisper. The guitars are mixed with these interesting slight delays. Uh, and I love the, the harmonized processed screams that sound inhuman. Uh, lyrically, it's more about the potential and power that the mind holds to overcome pain and sorrow, a more positive companion piece to defensive personalities. Uh, like within the mind is something that like lyrically would be totally in keeping with the stuff that's on the next two records and spiritual healing all he talked about how fucking awesome that is uh low life uh is a song about the supposed strong people look at those who they perceive to be weaker uh, and are less deserving of life than they think they are uh, i think the song isn't weak by any stretch of the imagination but its passages as a whole feel a bit thinner and stripped back instrumentally and lack the fullness that leprosy had which leads me to thinking that this is probably the weakest song on here for me uh, Genetic Reconstruction is a song that is pretty blatantly about uh, the idea of eugenics and the ethical dilemmas that come with it. Uh, Chuck really left no stone unturned here and sort of buzzes to life, doesn't relent. Uh, despite the occasionally still stiff drums, it's one of the more poignant moments on the record. And I have to agree with Sersha, I think Killing Spree is a terrific song. Uh, the chaotic and ascending descending guitars make for a great intro. It's dizzying. And it's a song about like, you know, normal person being sort of, you know, quote unquote, normal person being driven insane by the chaos of the modern world and then going on a terrifying killing spree, which again, this whole song feels weird and poignant because it's, if I'll be blunt, it feels like it's about like a QAnon member doing something crazy. <laughs> it's the kind of vibe I get from it. Right. Um, and it's a total fucking rager. Uh, it's one of the most ambitious moments on the records and uh, it has some towering riffs. And and yeah, I, I think to say it's the weakest death record is to do it a disservice, even if I do have to sort of unanimously come down on that. It's, it's not a record that I love 
quite as much as Scream Bloody Gore, but it's like, it has so many standout moments and so much that makes it unique that it's like, if you wanted to call this album the worst one, but to call it inessential is a flat out fucking lie and a complete yeah. disservice to it. Yeah, there are, there are simply, really there are simply no inessential death albums. Yeah. None, yeah. not at all. Well, like if, if this was your favorite, any, I'd look yeah. at you funny, but like it, it would be a bold choice, but I would respect it. Like if for any other reason that they each record captures a completely different facet of what death is, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't overlook any of them and they're all at least really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Fantastic. spiritual healing. So let's move into our favorite tracks and let's lay up. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. uh, Jake, mm -hmm. why don't you go first? Uh, my three favorite tracks are Spiritual Healing, Within the Mind, and Killing Spree. Uh, least favorite track, uh, I'll have to go with Low Life. Again, not a bad song. No bad death songs. Uh, and I give the album an 8 out of 10. Sure. So, um, this is getting scary now because <laughs> my favorite tracks are Killing Spree, Spiritual Healing, and... Uh, yeah, I'm gonna mm. uh, within the mind. Go on. Um, my least favorite is probably Low Life, but it's a great song. I'm giving the record an eight out of ten. Yeah, I really like Low Life. It's uh, not my least favorite here, but I definitely <laughs> understand. Uh, my three favorite tracks are fortunately different. Um, for the most part, I'm gonna pick um, of well, spiritual healing. I'm gonna pick obviously because it is. A fucking totemic track but i'm also mm -hmm. going to shout out living monstrosity and altering the future because i think they're pretty key to what this record is um to me the choices uh and least favorite track i mean again i really don't have a particular thing that sort of sticks out but i guess i'll go with killing spree um if i have to and i'm gonna rate this 8.5 out of 10 oh, maverick yeah. A slight variation in quality. Crazy. Oh my god. Imagine Listen, that average <laughs> should be 8.33 recurring. Is it right? It's um 8.17. Ah, okay. Uh, 8.33 gonna... would be if there was two of us. Yeah. Well, 8.33 would be if it'd given it a nine. Yeah. Oh Math. yeah, then yeah. Math. Uh be is eight point averaging out about eight point two. Records would give an eight point two. Reanimator plus it never goes out. Oh, wow. Okay. Reasonable. Um, right, okay. Right. okay. Well, okay. So we yeah. move forward yet again. New era. Uh, before That's we get to that, works. Though, <laughs> before we get to that, though, uh, it's worth mentioning that um, Spiritual Healing was followed by uh, an unsuccessful tour, uh, which Sheldoner actually refused to participate in, alleging that it had been poorly organized. So he was replaced on the tour for this record. Um, uh, Bill Andrews and Terry Butler were subsequently dismissed from the band um, and that meant that for the next record um, the lineup would be entirely new mm -hmm. um, uh, for the first time I think uh, yes so uh, Sheldoner went about selecting his players uh, progressive metal band Cynic who would go on to yes. release an incredibly influential debut record titled Focus in 1993 yep lent their guitarist Paul Masvidal and drummer Sean Reinhardt to the band for their next record and Sheldoner also recruited uh, one of the great death MVPs which is uh, bassist Steve DiGiorgio. Uh, the result of such a drastically different lineup is as you can imagine a significant shift in sound for the band. Uh, death could have easily continued recording albums like Leprosy and Spiritual Healing for the rest of their career and quite easily have been successful within their niche. But it was Sheldoner's next move that truly elevated the band from pioneering death metal greats to uncompromising, visionary, relentlessly forward-moving technical legends. And the record that cemented this is Human. Um, yeah, so Human was released in 1991. It is the shortest and most concise death record. And 34 it, minutes. It, it, yeah, 34 minutes, that's right. And it is absolutely perfect. I'm yep. not burying the lead there. 
Um, the rolling drum Chemistry. entry of flattening of emotions is iconic. And immediately you have a band somehow more pummeling and wild and unorthodox than ever it's, it's, before. It's, it, I felt afraid when that song started. <laughs> so yeah, it's me like too. distant sounding. You're just kind of like, what is, what, what is yeah, that? Yeah, and, and the way the guitars like, come in as well. Yeah. It, uh, and and Shouldener sounds darker, more troubled and tortured. This is a record that turns his thematic interests inward rather than focusing on the political this is a record much more concerned with the personal and the psychological as the cover might imply yes and yeah. obviously <laughs> the, the title um a flattening of emotions deals with isolation and self-distancing uh, a mind shared by an uninvited stranger recalls the previous record's defensive personalities but the image mm -hmm. here imagery here is much more abstract and haunting than anything on spiritual healing uh, suicide machine is ostensibly about euthanasia but is more pointedly about shoulderner's interest and in the reliance of people in suffering on others to assist them in dying how mm -hmm. easy it is to deny the pain of someone else's suffering oh god I had what that a lyric. down as well uh, it's just Shuldener, insanely good Shuldener acknowledges the ethical hypocrisy imbued in many of the extremists who oppose euthanasia and condemns their lack of empathy uh, unlike on the previous records, Altering the Future, for instance, where Schuldner avoided taking a specific stance on the topical issue of abortion, here he is clear and righteous and furious. Uh, Together as One focuses around a story of Siamese twins, and specifically the insularity and psychopathy of those who refuse to empathize and understand and instead only see the grotesque um, shades of the elephant man. Uh, the guitar I thought solo. of Dead Ringers, actually. Oh, specifically a dream sequence from that movie. That's actually, yeah, Cronenberg's probably even more pointed. Um, the guitar solo that comes in a minute and a half through this song is so clear and brazen and soaring that it feels like a primal expression of frustration from the twins themselves. Uh, Sh Shouldener develops his talent for crafting vocal melodies as well, proving that he can communicate equally well through stilted shrieks as through richer melodic variation. Um, a truly cynical and even misanthropic view of all humanity is displayed in a track like Secret Face, in which Shouldener castigates all nice. people as reliant on masks and disguises to protect their innately evil core from exposure. Once again, you get soloing that is more ambitious, shifting and uncompromising than ever before. Arrangements shifting from riff to riff and time signature to time signature is not new for death but never before have the shifts been this brisk and ballistic um de giorgio's bass work near the end of this track is astonishingly complex mm. and reinhardt's drumming makes even the talented bill andrews look standard by comparison um, perhaps the most overt hint of the band's increasing progressive tendencies is the clean opening of lack of comprehension uh, the track itself is maybe one of the most meta death songs up to this point, dealing with the general misunderstanding of the public for the purpose, intention, and catharsis of extreme music, specifically with regard to young people who kill themselves or others and then have bands blamed for their behavior or their or the things that they found comfort in misunderstood as somehow being these kind of toxic um, causes. And obviously this is kind of a prescient uh, issue which would come to the fore in, in, in heavy music much more in the late 90s around the time of Columbine and the aftermath of that um, but it's a great song uh, See Through Dreams uh, imagines the perception of a person blind since birth who is finally able to see while they are asleep it's not actually a, a very dark song at all topically more one no. simply fascinated with the way that we take our senses for granted and the nature of perception um, I mean you've gone from you've gone from shitting in your guts in uh, Scream Bloody Gore to imagining the nature of perception in this record uh, but it still feels very Schuldener through and through shows a writer becoming more and more fascinated with the extremes of the human experience of 
endurance and survival and thriving against the odds, a specific theme that would be uh, explored in much more detail on their very last record, which we'll get to. Um, the horrific scream into silence that echoes at the end of this track is one of the mm. most bone chilling mm. things in all of music. Mm. Um, and if the band's expansive ambition up to this point on this record were not already clear, Cosmic Sea upends all expectations of death as a band and Schuldner mm. as a musician. It is the first entirely instrumental death song, one of only two, and an absolute marvel of pioneering musical vision. It is pure technical wizardry. It incorporates unusual atmospherics that give it a strangely serene, beautiful feel, unlike any other death song. Reinhardt adopts a marching rhythm at certain points, then burbling synths ease into the piece as it fractures apart. De Giorgio's bass then comes in with a delightfully unusual pattern, and then we get solos from Schuldiner and Masvidal that are simply breathtaking, bleeding and buzzing and screeching and whining to a climax of unfathomable intensity and squalling and noise. It is a progressive opus in four minutes. Um, so where to go from there? Uh, on closing track, Vacant Planets, the thematic scope widens further. Schuldiner imagines the place of humanity in the universe as infinitesimal, insignificant, that we are one of likely countless species who have succumbed to the self-destructive urges that Schuldiner ultimately views as being an inherent part of intelligent life. Um, though this track is not as musically ambitious as Cosmic Sea and does suffer a teensy tiny bit by having to follow it the soloing here is still as marvelously fucked up as it is throughout the rest of the record and the track wraps a necessary thematic bow around the whole thing uh, i'm sorry i kind of just ended up talking about everything on this album but i adore That's every okay. second of it and i want to hear from both of you about what it is that you love the most about this record and what reason it is <laughs> well uh, not that I can say anything that hasn't been said, but um, it's not exactly a secret. This is probably my favorite death record. And I say probably only because, you know, as Sarah should kind of already put it, it's like the upper pantheon of these last four albums is just incomparable for me. Like I, I, I love them all so much and they are all as good as each other. And Human, I think, is comes down to being my favorite because there is sort of the aforementioned length, the sort of concentration of music into this sort of 34 minute uh, span. I will say there's also a version of this with a bonus track that covers a, a Kiss song. I think it's called God of Thunder. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that owns a uh, terrific, <laughs> listen does. to that if you haven't. Um, yeah, all their covers are great, uh, but uh, this one is just, it's so, it's concentrated, and I also just feel like this is the perfect midway point of their career, because they have such a solid trajectory of their sound. It's like they start off in that sort of first era of them inventing the sort of death metal thing, you know, rising from that sort of 80s, uh, you know, metal scene and building off of it. And then there's sort of the middle of their career where they still very much have that component of their sound, but they are fully in the tank for something that is way more progressive. Like this has officially become progressive death metal. And then there's the sort of last part of their career, which is just like only progressive. And it's just like they, they've sort of abandoned some of their more base roots. And this to me is the, the center of all of it. You get a little bit of everything with this record and I also just think that it's written immaculately it's performed amazingly like the fact that they made this a year after spiritual healing like what the what the fuck how do you do that I don't yeah, know it's been wild being a death fan and getting this record immediately <laughs> after <laughs> spiritual <laughs> healing I think you make a good point as well Jake this is really like the pivot point around which the whole discography kind of comes. changes in two directions like you have three albums on either side and it's kind mm -hmm. of like the crux the 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 apotheosis of death maybe in some that's senses. 
and fucking yet, and exactly. Yet, and yet it's maybe not the most definitive death album. <laughs> no, it's, it, I'd say, well, I mean, I will talk about when we talk about it, but I'd say that there is an album that's later down the road that is the definitive death album. And, you know, and that one's also great. But the thing I think about Human is that there's also just sort of like, since they were sort of beginning to like, it's, it's Chuck's writing, but like, you know, a step up from what it was before, but it's also very much still rooted in in something that's like not as purely existential as it would get later it's still a little bit more i mean it's a little bit more human but up up but up up yeah but but um i th- there's something distinctly relatable about it i think there's also like um like lack of comprehension for example tyler sort of touched on this is that it's like there is, I think this is an immaculately written song, mainly because it deals with its themes in a way that's like, uh, you know, sort of the purpose of, of extreme music in general is sort of like, it's them expressing their like, or Chuck expressing his anger at like, people blaming the things that people are like taking solace in, like their music and also failing to address the problems that necessitate music of this as a whole that would create such an extreme outlet for these people's problems. It's like, don't hate what I yeah. do, hate it, the people that make it, me do what I do. It's, it's an extension of his like interest in the ways in which um, people with power uh, have a vested interest in prolonging the suffering of others in the sense that yes. you, you you cannot have a thing of solace that um is that helps you um if it does not conform to a particular set of um you know pre-established conventions that you yeah, just you it, sort it, of have. exactly if the thing that you find solace in is a thing which goes against deviant the, or i guess is, is deviant way. from the um you know the norm, the norm. Where, from what the people what people in power have a vested interest in um ha- ensuring to be the thing then uh then you know it must be destroyed and and the yep. music is just one extension of that and i found this interesting that this is the only i think song that 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 explicitly considers um yeah, you know, on that meta level, like obviously, um, Sh- Chuck would write a bunch of songs that I think could be read in a meta way as kind of being self-interrogatory, but mm-hmm. this is the only song that kind of looks at at the music industry, I would say, or like or or p- politics as it relates to music. And there are later songs on later records that look at media more broadly, um, but I do think it's an interesting and really singular track, as well as just being one of the most instrumentally and nuts and and uh, oh yeah un- uncompromising tracks up to this point in their discography yeah that's the other thing about it too is that it just it sounds fucking incredible like no matter like you can maybe pick apart the first three death albums and identify little tiny things that you don't like about their sound whereas if you do it at this point i just think you're like you're, you're bad you're wrong stop it like th- there is nothing about this album that just doesn't sound positively perfect the guitar tones the the fucking rolling thundering drums the fucking chuck's incredibly well implemented screams which have evolved just flawlessly at this point i um and like the 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 writing in a song like suicide machine like listen to this shit you have you know you just started with scream bloody gore which is just like i'm gonna you know take a shit in your intestines i'm gonna eat your face off blah 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 it's just like yeah it's cool but also in the span of four years we've come to a point where they're singing songs like this where it says controlling their lives deciding when and how they will die a victim of someone else's choice the one who's the ones who suffer have no voice manipulating destiny when it comes to living no one seems to care but when it comes to wanting out those with power will be there prolong the pain how long will it last suicide machine a request to die with dignity is that too much to ask and it's just like it's so righteous and it's so like you can just tell that it's delivered with such immediate conviction that maybe wasn't quite there on spiritual healing but is just it it is unapologetic here um 
I love flattening of emotions. I love the way it's sort of that slow fade in. It's immediately heavy, immediately crushing. Uh, it expands on some of the more psychological and spiritual themes that the last, last record was getting at, talking about the inner depths of the mind and how vast and infinite it can be and how one can become lost within it. And Chuck talks about the vanishing of the person that once was and the influence of outside forces and dark spirits that irreversibly alter and consume you from within turning you into something that is not only different from what you once were but perhaps something that you were never even intended to be which is fucking horrific and um paul uh masvidal's guitar work here is like he is you can't not mention how fucking outstanding it is um it's it's faster it's meaner it's bigger than previous records somehow even though i threw every possible superlative i possibly could at them there is just there is no the, the drums there is no hyperbole in the English language that can accurately convey the sustained excellence of the drumming on Human, on the drumming on the following three records. Uh, it, it, the, the abrupt stop at the end is, is like being in a car going 50 miles an hour that suddenly puts on the brakes and you fly out the fucking wheel, windshield and then suicide machine starts. And it's, it just starts with this fucking riff and then it takes off like a rocket. And then the slapped bass kicks starts the song proper and it's just like oh my fucking god um and then like you know looking into the lyrics of a song like this i feel like a lesser band wouldn't be able to pull it off because they would do it differently they this would be the moment where any other metal band would uh break up the acoustic guitars and maybe give us a slower more somber fade to black style ballad because of how introspective and dark it is which you know i wouldn't begrudge them but if anything death takes what they already had on the opening two tracks takes up to 11 and takes it as a challenge of just being like oh you think we can't cover songs like this with our within our established wheelhouse uh well no fuck you we're gonna do it anyway and and they did and they did it better than anybody ever fucking did and then you go into like there, there there's just oh fucking together is one it's it's sort of hinted at in the title but the song is the grisly story of conjoined twins is told as a, a cronenbergian body horror story about how their deformity is considered an abomination and how the pain of their deformation affects their lives uh, and how their lives and subsequently their deaths are intrinsically connected to one each other and how this unique perspective lets them see life and the beyond in a way that no one else can chuck's fascination with how society at large treats those with malformations or disabilities as a common theme on all their records but it's very brutal here and very all-encompassing and holistic the song just cuts like a fucking knife right through you and the guitars punctuating the ends of the lines of the chorus is fucking sick and then secret face the fake out start stop beginning is great considering the riff here feels like a like judas priest in the midst of their speed metal era and it just breaks your fucking neck it's a song that hints of stuff that's about like jungian psychology the way i read it the secret face sort of a metaphor for the shadow or other self that's often mentioned in that way of thinking and how the secret face can corrupt and contort you into a monster and this is just a fantastic meat and potatoes track where the last Lack of structural ambition allows the band to flex their muscles in a more traditionally robust way, which I think is refreshing considering the last three songs. And then there's, of course, I mentioned lack of comprehension, which I think is beautifully written. Um, and See Through Dreams, which like it's a song literally about extending beyond the limits of human perception because of a limitation that you suffer from uh, into something supernatural and otherworldly almost. Chuck is taking the things that make people suffer and inverting them into something that also gives them strength or like an insight that other people don't have. Um, and it describes the euphoric sensory experience that comes with like opening your third eye and being able to see into the beyond in a way that you previously couldn't. And that's what the song itself feels like. And appropriately at the end, the music just fucking transcends and becomes consumed by a wall of sound that to be perfectly honest, I don't have the slightest clue as to what this sound even is. It merely absorbs, it surrounds you like a ray of otherworldly light. And it is my single favorite moment in the band's discography when you, you reach this moment of sonic enlightenment and it seamlessly transitions into my favorite song in the band's entire catalog which is cosmic sea which is maybe the only time my favorite song from a band has been an instrumental ever but i mean everything tyler said about this is just fucking true it begins with the harmonized ethereal like 
choir of vocals and guitars that sound big enough to break an entire planet. And this combined sensory overload is just positively beautiful. It's breaking into that new dimension that hinted at on the previous track and encompasses everything that the band does, every possible talent, every moment of instrumental excellence. Everything about death is in the DNA of the song. And it remains exciting from start to finish. Midway through, it just like warbles through a sea of electronic waves uh, and distortion that honestly, I I would not find out of place in like a more contemporary melodic death metal release. Like uh, I'm reminded a lot of Abigail Williams walk beyond the dark when I listen to this album, uh, specifically this moment in particular, which is fucking amazing. And considering they do explore uh, sort of melodic death metal elements in their later career, that is, you know, the checks. Um, but sort of like afterwards the song sort of just kind of rolls to life after like this very solemn guitar passage and it just demolishes you and there's this chaotic swirling of drums and guitars that comprise the final minute of this song and it's like it's something straight out of a nightmare it sounds fucking unholy it it, it possibly is my favorite instrumental ever and then vacant planets which uh um, the closer here ends the album as appropriately behemoth as it began and the song does so much with so little and I almost feel like that's sort of like that strong beginning of like flattening of emotions is very introspective and personal and every song in the album structurally sort of spirals out into this thing that encompasses eventually the whole universe which again structurally fucking brilliant. Uh, and lyrically, it's kind of like a science fiction story that encompasses all the themes of the album about like how overwrought corporate greed and then capitalism and exploitation has uh, ruining all habitation. And like a, there's a desperate voyage throughout space to find a place that's habitable, but humanity has become so monstrous and evil and so evolved to survive the impossible conditions that they themselves have created. And they can, that they can only live in the most horrid, stark, cosmic terror laden landscapes imaginable it's brain matter expanding and the riffs just pummel you so far into the ground by the end of it i feel like i can see hell and then it just fucking stops and i mean like it's 30 minutes and it'll change your perception of music fuck yeah. yeah fuck yeah um not much else to add no, right, well, it's wonder, perfect. I wonder what rating this is getting. <laughs> All right. All right. Favorite tracks. Um, I'll go first. Okay. Um, my three favorite tracks are Suicide Machine, Cosmic Sea, Lack of Comprehension, uh, and No Least Favorite Track. And the thing gets the most emphatic 10 out of 10 possible. Amazing. My favorite tracks are Cosmic Sea, Flattening of Emotions. There are so many good tracks. I hate this. Um, and I'm going to choose Suicide Machine. Fuck it. Um, it's getting a 10, everybody. Wonderful. Well, my three favorite tracks are, in fact, See Through Dreams, Cosmic Sea, Vacant Planets, and Flattening of Emotions, Suicide Machines Together is One Secret Face and uh, like Comprehension. Uh, <laughs> all of them. All, literally all of them. Um, uh, least favorite fucking none because I'm not a fucking loser. And this gets a 10. This gets a 10. So let's, let's show what that average rating is. Oh, look, it's, it's 10 out of 10. Oh my God. So that must yeah. be up there with Ride the Lightning and Dead Wing and yeah. what else? It's two Twilight Sad Records. Um, dummy, home... did we give dummy all tens? No. We didn't give dummy all tens. No. Dummy is at nine. What happened with dummy? Um, yeah, so three people gave it a ten. Um, I gave it a nine and a half, and Jake oh, gave well, it a nine. Well, well, you both can take the L. On that one. <laughs> um, anyway, no, uh, yeah, and Karen Lowell and all that. So fantastic. Okay, so another death album, another lineup change. Uh, it was nice to know you, Maz Vidal and Reinhardt. They're back to their main band. Um, and in we have a new lead guitarist, or second lead after Sheldon, of course, Andy LaRock, and new drummer, Gene Hoglan, who, of course, would... A fucking boy! Who, of course, would memorably go on to drum for Strapping Young Lad on some of the heaviest progressive metal records ever made. Hoglan 
I think it's fair to say, is the best drummer Death ever had. And yep. his work on individual thought patterns and symbolic is absolutely integral to the respective mastery of both of them. As, in fucking sane. As we alluded to earlier, this record perhaps gets a little overlooked being sandwiched between two towering pillars of the band's discography. Um, but I mean, yeah, I'm going to be frank and say I think it's ch- fucking nearly as masterful. Uh, it is the band's desire to sound huger and denser and more vicious than ever is immediately visible on the pr- vaguely proggy, overactive imagination, which is probably one of their fastest tracks to date and mm-hmm. an absolutely blistering opener. Uh, the track itself visualizes the ways in which people enact and construct their own uh, fabricated reality, uh, mastering the art of deception to create the act of manipulation, in Sheldon's words. Um, then further, you have a song like Trapped in the Corner, which examines what happens when people get lost within their creation at the whim of it and the nakedness of having that stripped away. Um, I talked the shit out of human last time so i want to hear from um you two first on what you f- feel about this record and where it sits in the death discography well personally i completely agree with your assessment that it is sort of overlooked in the discography i mean it's obviously well regarded it does incredibly well rating wise but it's definitely like of the death albums people talk about they there's like i think the it's fair to say the the three sort of titans are human sound of perseverance and symbolic and this one as a result is is sort of overlooked because it's in the midst and i think that like again it's sort of seen as like a, a transition sort of album of like going from human to the more like ambitious heights of something like symbolic but i i don't think it suffers from being a transitory album i think that all of these things are also its strengths in fact if you compare it less to symbolic and more to human that's where i think you find a lot of what makes this album super special in that i think i view it as the more like unhinged and and just slightly more unkempt cousin to human which is more like human for as wild and as as chaotic and and blistering as it is is still very reined in and contained it's it's very like planned and meticulous whereas individual thought patterns by comparison is gnarlier and more wild and more vicious and louder and just angrier and more unruly and i think it finds a a supremely valuable identity in doing that i think that overactive imagination again fucking wild the the drumming here is frankly illegal. It is a war crime. One of the band's most aggressive songs, full stop, and the guitars here are monstrous, and the, the way that the lyrics sort of painted is like a overactive imagination as a tool used by those in power to manipulate those around them is, you know, frankly inspired. Um, in human form, the more robust sound really complements the whole album, but especially here. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of the record is the bass playing. The incredibly prominent, very sour bass playing is front and center on nearly every single song, and you could hear every tiny little bit of it the sort of harmonized guitar solo at the start is titanic even when the mixing decides to be a bit leaner and meaner like it was on say spiritual healing it's still unbelievably vicious in a way that that record just wasn't and the less stiff drums make it feel so fully realized human may have been progressive but this album and the two that follow are progressive with a capital fucking p uh jealousy one of my absolute favorite death songs Uh, a chaotic spiraling spiraling song that feels like it features the bass at its most sour, punctuating the end of every single line. It's a fascinating song lyrically about the sort of uniqueness that the human mind can yield in terms of like jealousy and how people want to possess the intricacies and singularities of others' minds that they deem more valuable than theirs. and, and valuing what makes them special uh, and wanting to either possess or exploit it and sort of embodies the name of the song very well. And the guitars in the second half of this, I can only describe it as being consuming. They eat you alive. It's basically mirroring the idea of wanting to take something and overpower it and make it yours and just destroy it. 
and then you go into trapped in the corner which is another one of the best songs on the album which is uh, this claustrophobic and panicked song until the clattering drums just sort of break it down into a descending spiral of madness it's a song about watching powerful and greedy men chase unattainable goals that their ideologies lead them towards which feels really cathartic these days um to listen to the second half just feels like uh the soloing is trying to rip me in half uh nothing is everything a song about how mental health health can deny you the very reality of a normal existence which is both evocative and powerful especially as the guitars here push along chuck's vocal delivery uh it revels in the futility of its potential suffering uh, mentally blind, another takedown of ignorance from the eyes of the powerful. Chuck's delivery here is more manic and angry, and the chorus builds into something triumphant sounding and dominating. And it's a song that gets my blood boiling with both motivation and contempt and a perfect primal rage scream. There's the title track where the drums and bass punctuate the hurried guitar lines on this song and make it feel like it's pressing into the back of your skull, burring its way into you. It's a song about a, the frustration of a lack of empathy being a universal experience and how the insecurities and fear of the strong shape rules and judgments that unknowingly and systematically harm those beneath them. Uh, Destiny um, comes after that and it's a haunting song that begins with an acoustic passage and it's like a there's like a gentle Spanish guitar and it like where the the sounds of something like Cosmic Sea on the previous record rear their head until the proper electric guitars break down the door. The, the horror of time pushing us forward and furthering us towards our inevitable end in the form of death being expressed both seamlessly lyrically, but also Chuck's delivery, which sounds terrified, uh, out of touch, a monolithic beginning that feels operatic in scale. And man, I'm literally running out of ways to say how fucking hard the guitars go at this point in their career. It's smooth, it's flowing, it's cascading until it angularly rips itself apart in the second half and it's doing something way more jagged and rough sounding that you wouldn't find on any of their albums before this and then it ends with one of my favorite songs of the album which is the philosopher which is a howling catastrophic closer that alternates between fearsome instrumental passages with live willowy bass work that makes this song feel almost sick and pained and the bass guitars and solos just sort of duel at the end until the song fades out like a battle that is slowly disappearing as you get further and further away from it an internal and external conflict that refuses to die or end one of the few times where a fade out ending a song feels appropriate thematically to imply something like cyclical and man i don't know this just on its own i, I just feel like this is so fearsome and and risky especially compared to human and, and i honestly like it just as much as the albums that surround it and i feel like it gets a bit of a bad not a bad rep obviously but it, it, its identity is one that i think is essential when you learn about understanding where the band's trajectory was and i feel like this maybe doesn't get the credit that it's due in terms of how much of a risk it is and how much fucking instrumental prowess is being showed because it's like before every other album is just like yeah it's like one of the best people to ever do it at the top of their game doing this thing and so it kind of gets like lost in the sort of uh, the minutia of just like yeah of course they were good but when you just look at the ways in which this is good and the risks that it took oh i i, I love it i love it to death literally <laughs> yeah i i can't really disagree this record slaps so fucking hard. It it it, it slaps, it, it slapped my tits clean off, and I need to get them back. Anyway, um, it's just yeah. Uh, it is one of the most musically complex. It, it's one of the records of theirs that draws from the most influences at once. Um, and uh, yeah, it's also maybe one of the most accessible death records like occasionally you listen to it and you're like there are do i hear a hook is is there a hook in this song if you're already um, into death metal yes you're correct but i would yeah. not start here if you're listening to this band this is a in fact a terrible place to start yeah no i'll agree with that for sure uh, it sure. is worth mentioning that yeah every track here is is shorter than five minutes and mm -hmm. so it does have a real kind of continuous forward moving punchiness to it um that i think is maybe what sasha is getting at yeah totally thank you yeah um the opener overactive imagination is, is like really 
it's really like textural. Like I feel like I can feel its uh, tongue um, and hold it in my hands. But it's also completely a, a total hellraiser. Um, comes out of the gate feeling sort of strangled. And it sort of busts in. And it stops and starts in relentless waves. Um, transitioning later into really like groovy sort of thrash inspired death metal um, that I found really, really satisfying. Um, in human form is another deep, uh, is another groove oriented bruiser that really works for me. Um, jealousy opens with a raging vocal screaming, what did you want from me? Um, and just that open-ended sense of rage drives this song. The bass almost feels like woozy at points, um, mm -hmm. adding a totally new texture to their catalog that you'd see uh, the fruition of on probably The Sound of Perseverance. Um, and it has a solo that does nothing short of aesthetically beautiful. Um, trapped in, in a corner, it's often deeply melodic, but also guttural and aggressive. Nothing is, everything has amazing bass work. This wonderful descending guitar hook and just general, the work on, on people who play instruments with strings and the drumming and the singing, it's, it's all outstanding. Um, men, yeah, uh, mentally blind. Um, the future for you is nowhere is a line that comes up. Um, there are, and, th th and that line is said with something to visceral force. Uh, there are organs on this, in the background of the song that remind me of, the, they give it uh, an air of Fabio Prezzi um, who composed the scores for many of the song uh, films we talked about with Scream Bloody Gore. Um, and it's just a groovy and pummeling riff. The title track rules. Uh, track eight uh, uh, brings in acoustic guitars and synths, but not for long, so it goes into this absolutely like sludgy, sh uh, shuddering, heavy, aggressive um, feeling uh, majority to itself. Out of Touch is a highlight for me. It sounds practically hellish, um, like actual demons are playing the instruments. Um, and again, I get big fritzy vibes with this song. Um, and The Philosopher is an amazing closer with incredible lyrics, uh, sort of punch of pretension. Um, you know much about nothing at all being one of my favorite lines. Uh, it is brisk, uh, but an absolutely punishing closer uh, to cap out a record. If I had to nitpick, um, there are elements of the mastering that don't vibe with me, but that's a real nitpick because this record is excellent. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole heap to add. I kind of trying to think about like maybe, maybe why it's relative lack of esteem in the catalog is due to the fact that it's the first record that I think doesn't see like a marked shift in Schuldner's lyrical interests, but mm -hmm. I don't necessarily see that as a as a criticism necessarily um much of the tracks here as the title suggests are extensions of the psychological musings of human uh with different specific vocal points but a generally similar lens um but yeah as i've already said the band more than account for the similarity between the two records by playing more feverishly heavily and intricately than ever before i mean that's kind of a broken record sentence with regard to death but it's true of every single record and if human is a contained and pummeling punch of shoulder's howling psyche then individual thought patterns is a sprawling manic freewheeling beast that grabs you and shakes you and throws you around um yeah i want to highlight the philosopher in particular a really interesting close they actually had a music video that played on mtv if you can believe that or not wow um uh, on the face of it it's a screed against those who claim to understand knowledge and the nature of the perceived world and philosophy and that sort of thing um but it has a really great line uh, do you feel what i feel see what i see hear what i hear it's really pointed at getting to the heart of Schuldner's belief in the um and that the idea of intellectualizing perception and intellectualizing uh, the way we understand the world is this fruitless task um, and, and ultimately serves as a, a tool that only, can only be used to oppress people further. It's kind of a very, very cynical view, obviously, but it's one of the most interesting uh, viewpoints and, and, and aspects of, of 
of call Sheldon, me a cynic because I agree. Mr. Of Sheldon's <laughs> view of humanity, I find it really interesting, and and he delves into it some more on the next record that we'll get to. Um, and also yeah. I want to shout out um Steve DiGiorgio's um fretless bass work on um this track mm. is has is a really delightfully bendy sound that interacts really neatly with the school and guitar. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's very difficult to find a fault with this record. Uh, uh, fantastic stuff. All right. Um, I, I, I would I would certainly agree with you that on this record especially, but also on like almost every, on every other death record, it the presence of the personality, of the, per, the presence of the personality, sorry, of Chuck himself is uh, one of the largest draws and really captivating all across um, their work. Yeah. Um, yes, completely agree. All right, favorite tracks and ratings. Um, Jake, what are your favorite tracks? My favorite tracks are um, The Philosopher, Jealousy, and Trapped in a Corner. Least favorite, I don't have one. And this is another 10. Okay, amazing. Well, my favorite tracks are um, I'm going to go with Mentally Blind, um, Out of Touch and eh, let's go with nothing is everything but they're all great i'm gonna give this record a nine out of ten wonderful um my three favorite tracks are overactive imagination trapped in a corner and the philosopher uh again no real least favorite track uh if i had to pick one i might go for out of touch uh, and i'm gonna tread the middle line and give this a 9.5 out of 10 9.5 average let's go Shock, shockingly a 9.5 average. right next to leprosy oh my god oh my god yeah owns time knows master of puppets yeah wonderful okay yeah. Well, oh man the time has come uh for death the love supreme album. of death metal i mean yeah <laughs> for death if you disagreed if you disagreed with me i was about to say you said that <laughs> yeah no I, I i agree with myself i was just thinking about like how i would even genre describe it now but yeah no it is yeah. it is totally that um for death's sixth album uh andy larock is replaced by bobby kelbel i don't know how to say his name but i'm gonna say Kel i don't either Kelbel. and steve de giorgio is replaced by kelly conlon uh gene hoglin once again returns to drum uh the record symbolic is released in March 1995 and immediately it is clear that death have made something totemic progressive beyond even the wildest dreams of the last few records and a unique alchemy of talent that fuses for a moment of sheer musical godliness this is the stars aligning it feels like a celestial event not to be too hyperbolic um, it has become widely accepted as death's finest hour. And while fans may continue to debate which one they would put at the ultimate top, uh, it is absolutely indisputable that Symbolic is a peerless technical achievement. And I won't bury the lead. It's my favorite death album. A basic take, but I don't care. Um, it's it's kind of hard not to have a basic take with death, yeah. honestly, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, this album is uh so there's 10 out of 10 albums this album is a 100 out of 100 <laughs> album um every fucking moment the Perfect. opening the opening lyric of the record is iconic i don't mm. mean to dwell but i cannot help myself when i feel the vibe and taste a memory of a time in life when years seemed to stand still that to me is like the opening line of the great gatsby of the fucking yeah. great mm -hmm. american novel type that's that's that eat I'm shit a tale there. of two cities like that line you from that opening lyric we're immediately greeted with a chuck shoulder singing in first person nostalgic even bittersweet the nuanced and thoughtful emotional tone of symbolic is immediately signaled and it's like you are getting a writer who is has already displayed greatness multiple times spreading his wings and revealing himself to be a an angelic creature 
uh, Kelbel's contributions, style and flavor cannot be undersold in the effect of why the riffage, playful melodic lines and incandescent soloing of symbolic feel so vividly rich and astounding. Sheldoner's rotating band style, continually dropping and adding new members, whether fully intentional or not, was a masterstroke. That meant that death never stayed static and were a constantly evolving and fluid band. Each record is a snapshot of a state and of a combination of minds that is unique to that moment. Sheldoner's vocals are immaculately clear and violent. He sounds better than ever before. His voice is more frayed, his screams are more hoarse, yet his enunciation is more pointed than ever, making every word hit with a clarity and an aggression all of its own. He takes on power structures, though in a much less blunt and bald-faced way than in records like Spiritual Healing. Zero Tolerance asserts this is not a test of power. This is not a game to be lost or won. Let justice be done. As strong and as pointed of a political statement as he has ever written, righteous fury unspooled the riffs in this record are constantly changing they're always blistering they're absolutely absurdly brilliant there's a real spaciousness to the mix too that allows everything to feel larger and more overwhelming than ever and this can be attributed at least in part to new producer jim morris who replaces scott burns behind the boards and assists in sheldoner's desire to make the band sound more expansive and colossal than ever before in the spectacular empty words Sheldon Ugh. expands on the theme that he explored in the philosopher but he shows a more pointed clarity the answer cannot be found in the writing of others or the words of a trained mind in a precious world of memories we find ourselves confined the riff during the chorus of this track is one of my favorites the band ever recorded just perfectly immense and melodic and swirling um and then Sheldoner even expands his scope beyond humanity here on the track Sacred Serenity. Uh, in his words, this song is about animals, for me especially dogs and cats. They don't know anything about the end of their lives. They are just so free-minded. We may suspect when our life will end, but animals don't. They live their lives without questions, without analysis. They are just happy when they can see us. For me, it's all this, this is all very important that they feel good and are happy. Wholesome Chuck moment there. But also there's, you know, a beautiful um, expansion of his interest in not just the human experience, but the experience of living. Um, and Sheldon sees a purity in animals that he longs for. And I find that longing really poignant in a way that i haven't quite felt a poignancy like this on a death record up to this point it's a reflection for the fascination with the sweet elusive haven of innocence that he strives for and that the title track explores uh, a song which describes innocence as a high that can never be bought or sold um, Sheldoner gets downright Orwellian on the singular 1000 eyes, examining government surveillance. Uh, without judgment is a screed against the media and presumably the sideshow of several high profile trials that were ongoing in the 90s. The ways in which murder becomes an ugly sideshow of finger pointing and distraction from the ugliness of ourselves. Without judgment, what would we do? we would be forced to look at ourselves emerged in lost time. The way that you have transformed from death as a sideshow in the carnal sense of the early records to looking at the way that death becomes a literal sideshow in reality and, and the, through the media, through the ways in which um, this, the privacy and, and, and intimate moments of a person's last you know, breaths are become this huge politicized um, thing that is, you know, sullies their memory and sullies their um, purity and their innocence or whatever. It's a really, really beautifully nuanced expansion of a theme that um, Chuck's always been interested in. Uh, Crystal Mountain excoriates religious hypocrisy the ways in which religious doctrine is twisted to serve the interests of the powerful at any point in time. Sheldoner's solo in this track is 
gloriously melodic it is surging and beautiful even though it's quite brief the song continues rollicking forward and then the flamenco guitar and the final stretch is just oh my god jaw dropping um misanthrope has a stunningly fast heavy melodic opening riff that is one of my favorites in the entire death discography the track assumes the perspective of alien life forms observing humanity judging like a god and casting a damning verdict opinion dangerous the track <laughs> The, uh, the, uh, the cascading half speed riff two minutes in just one of those many examples throughout the record of Schuldner and co bucking tradition every so often just to keep listeners on edge <laughs> and then you get the epic eight minute closer perennial quest in which Schuldner takes on fittingly his most expansive topic yet the meaning of life itself more specifically, finding meaning in life, the journey to achieve happiness, the cost of that, but the importance of it as perhaps the only way to defeat the inherent ugliness in everything. The melodic exploration here is truly second to none. The soloing is heavier than ever. The sludgy breakdowns are fucking vicious. The clean soloing and plucked melody of the outro of this track is beautiful beyond words. Guitar tones just cascading and melting across the soundscape. It's enough to bring me close to tears. Um, and they would obviously explore some of this more on the next record. But for me, this is the outro of this track is so stunningly uh, next level serene. And I just, my mind is blown to pieces. This album is, is <laughs> it's surely one of the most perfect pieces of art I've ever encountered in the sense that it is so manifold and layered and, and, and deeply deeply personal but also deeply political but also deeply societal and social and just everything that makes Sheldon a great writer everything that makes the performers great everything that makes him such a fantastic orchestrator of sound is at its absolute pinnacle on this record for me uh I am in awe <laughs> yeah I had a, the experience today of realizing this is my favorite death album. Um, but we have entered the stage now of, um, and now we get to talk about my two favorite death albums, but this is my preferred choice. Um, it just hit me today how there isn't a moment of this that isn't pretty much perfect. Yeah. Um, and it's quite hard to add to what Tyler said because it was comprehensive and accurate. Um, but th this record uh, is one of the longer ones, but it feels like it just goes by. Like, oh, ah. yeah. Um, it, 51 of the shortest minutes you will ever spend mm, with music. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the opener especially is one of the best tracks that I've ever recorded, uh, as are uh, Crystal Mountain for me. That's another absolute standout. Um it, it's just um, the pinnacle of uh, their sort of musical experimentation up to this point, matched with the absolute visceral quality their music has. And they sort of intersected sort of dual arcs to complement each other the best that they ever do on this record. Um, it's exciting. It's hard as fucking nails. Um, and, and it's it's just um, an incredibly exciting record, and it's haunting at the end uh, that it it covers an exhaustive and comprehensive thematic portrait expressed with real beauty uh, in its lyrics that come through like a man trying to ruin his own vocal cords. Um, it, it's it is beauty delivered with harshness and ugliness. Um, the, one has come to expect from death, but has reached the real pinnacle here. And Jesus wept. Is it like a real transcendent experience? Um, yeah, it's it's focused. It's it's complete, and and I love it. it it's hard. 
Uh, as Morgan said, there are only so many in, in our Discord chat. There are only so many ways to say this is the hardest shit I've heard in my life, you know. And look, he do be spitting. He 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 yeah. he made some points. And you know, that's the that's the trouble when you get down this far into death's career. It's just like, you know, I ran out of superlatives four albums ago. So where do you even <laughs> what do you even say? And it's just like, especially with records like human symbolic and sound of perseverance which on depending on the day of the week i will tell you that any of those three are my favorite uh it, it is it is always constantly switching between human and this one and this last one like i i, I can't it, it is so fucking hard to pick but symbolic was the first um dead album i ever heard and like to to give people like an idea of what this album is like and like like you say it's transcendental and it's just like oh you know hyperbolic that's a you know word to say it's good it's like no like when i say transcendental i mean when this when i first heard this album i was pretty storied when it came to metal i had delved into several discographies i knew sev several different subgenres. you know i'd like to think that i knew my shit and i heard this and i literally just did not know how to process it I was just like, this is operating at such a level that it feels like if music is like speaking a language, this is not only a language that I don't speak or understand, but it's also in like a dialect that I don't get. And it's just like, I know enough to know that this is good and it is technically proficient, but it's also so harsh and overpowering and brutal and big that it's just it's hard to be able to truly look at the scope of what you're dealing with here it's like looking at the fucking sun it, it, you yeah know, yeah you if, I, if I tell you that, yeah, yeah the next record on my like top stuff for first listens of 2021 the next one's at number five the, then it's hand cannot erase by stephen wilson oh boy and then and then it's this one and then it's it's Dying Star by Rustin Kelly, and then it's the Giles Corey self-titled. That's oh boy, we 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 are sad bitches. But um, yeah. Uh, not to say that Symbolic is exactly devoid of, of sadness, which I mean, like it is basically a highlight reel of everything Death has ever covered, but mentioned and talked about in a way that's just so brilliant. I mean, the the writing here is so. It's the kind of stuff that makes you angry that people have these facile judgments of the genre that it's just like, oh, it's just a bunch of guys with guitars being angry and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like you read the lyrics to these songs and it's fucking poetry. It's yeah, it's, it's like Chaucer, you know, it's like it. It is like Chaucer with like the mixture of beauty and vulgarity and insight, you know? Yeah, it's just like this is this is a, a feat. And it should be considered as such. But then again, it's also not like so a part of it. Like, you know, you have a song like Misanthrope, which has mm. maybe my favorite hook the band has ever had with Misanthrope, hate a revolt, man, kind, fucking. Yeah, and I, I <laughs> love the way that that song, it's like, it's hard and it's nasty. But like the message is really just to love people, you know? Yeah, I know. It's just like, it it, it it has that. It has that sort of like innocence that Chuck had, which like, I, I do feel like it's important to say that it's like, you know, obviously I didn't know the dude or anything, but it's like, from all accounts, mm -hmm. Chuck was a beautiful example of a person. He was a, from all records, he was a kind, empathetic, nurturing presence who was it's just like he is a quintessential example of it's just like he made ugly music because he was getting the bad shit out of him so that he could like mm. feel normal and i feel like this might be this and the next record are like some of the purest it's not like even the distillation of like sadness or depression but it's just like pure frustration like a philosophical sort of inability to sort of understand why people like that's kind of what um oh hell uh it's it's kind of what this album really in general is about like especially in songs like sacred serenity or empty words where it's like there's just this sense of like you don't know like the 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 fact that people claim to have all these answers and all these like insights and understanding and power and all of that stuff and the fact that it's like Chuck's entire philosophy is distilled into this of just like trying to accept how small we are as not like an indictment of some sort of um 
it's not like just to say like, oh, you know, we, we're small, we're small and we don't matter, but it's just like, we all need to accept and sort of embrace this sort of collective humility that we won't always know everything. And it's just this very, very pure ideology that I think is, is beautifully expressed here. And like, and as you said, I think this is just like, it blends being written like, you know, Th this could battle it out with the best of the the likes of Robert Frost, but also you know you again you have mess it through, hey the revolt man, God, and it's just fucking it goes so fucking, and I I just like to to dance around all that to the floweriness and the things that I think make this special from a writing perspective from a philosophical perspective. It also just doesn't matter because it mm -hmm. fucking Crystal Mountain, how. How does one, like, I, I don't understand how anyone can make a song this inhumanly perfect and how ridiculously chuggingly fast this is where it's just like, you, you hear it instantly and you're just, you're, you're taking it back. You're pummeled. It's, it's, it's an unreal experience. One of my favorite experiences that I've had with the entirety of music is when I did a simultaneous listen when Tyler first heard this for the first time and I listened to it along with him and it was just like an entire hour's worth of DMs of us in all caps being like, oh, oh my God, what the fuck? Like it just losing mm. our minds. It's just like, this is a record that I've heard 20 times before this point and I'm still just listening to it and I'm like, this is so fucking immediate and dense and colossal that it's just it's it's in it, the album cover is such a perfect demonstration of what it's like to actually hear this music it's like looking at this all-seeing eldritch thing it's like this thing the, the 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 cover of this is the music in the sense that it's like an angel but like an actual biblical angel that you look at and it's got like 50 eyes and it's like it doesn't have like a form that can be interpreted by like a human like visage so that it just kind of like searingly melts your brain and it's just like yeah this is this is what this is like and it's also just the most instrumentally virtuosic thing i've ever heard in my entire life yeah indeed i and like just how do you they, they've been making albums that are like nary over 40 minutes long and then they come around and make one that approaches on being an hour and yet is just like so seamlessly yeah. structured and paced that it just does not matter. like it feels as short as human and it's almost twice as long yeah absolutely right it's, right. it's the pinnacle of death in my opinion I, i'll i'll talk about sound of perseverance but it's just like this is the, this is the Crystal Mountain. Yeah, this is, They've been... for me, the quintessential death record. The, yes, yeah. that's the, this is the album that I was hinting at earlier. This is what their entire career built to, and this is capitalizing on everything that came before mm. it. So, I mean, like, it deserves its place and then some, honestly. Yeah, all right. So let's go and give this some tens. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so favorite tracks, I'll go first. Um, my favorite tracks are... Um, symbolic, zero tolerance, um, empty words, sacred serenity, one thousand eyes, <laughs> without judgment, <laughs> crystal mountain, misanthrope, misanthrope, and perennial request. The album gets a one hundred out of ten. Yes, figuratively speaking, the, the, this score goes to one hundred. Sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> but no, um, that's great. Uh, my favorite tracks are Crystal Mountain, Symbolic, uh, and I'm going to go, uh, fuck it, uh, Zero Tolerance. It's going a 10, add 10. 10. Well, uh, my three favorite tracks, other than all of them, <laughs> Misanthrope, Crystal Mountain, and Symbolic. Least yes. favorite, literally yes. go fuck yourself. 10 out of 10. Amazing. Absolutely. Suddenly the second band ever to get two uh, perfect tens out of us. Uh, it's going to be the first one to get three, bitches. Let's <laughs> yeah, fucking go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Moving on to the final uh, record in our discussion today. Lineup changes. Um, gone are Bobby Kelbel, uh, Kelly Conlon, and Gene Hoglan. Replacing Kelbel is Shannon Ham. Replacing Conlon is Scott Clendenin. And replacing Hoglan is Richard Christie. Um, though it's fair to say that death went full, full progressive death metal on Symbolic, here they dive deeper into that aesthetic. 
such that any trace of their traditional death metal sound is really all but gone. Um, Schuldiner's vocals are harsher than ever, uh, and the band explore arrangements that shift in more dramatic ways than they ever have before. Um, I will take a step back here and let the two of you discuss your feelings and perspectives on this record. Yeah, can I go first if that's okay? Yeah. Go for it. Because I, I love this record so much. Um, like the first time I heard it, it was, I was kind of hungover. It was the morning after we'd recorded an episode and I just sat down in, in a sofa and, and I turned off the lights and I put this on. And like from like 30 seconds to a minute, I, I wasn't I wasn't vibing, but then the next fifty five minutes disappeared from my life as this album ripped my brain apart. Um, yeah, and it's it's it just uh, it's their most expansive record. Again, um, the cover of especially the deluxe edition I think really captures what this record is like to listen to. Snap. Um, in that it's it's like a huge mountain and you are slowly attempting to climb up it and the it's mountain has a, eat you. the mountain has a mouth it is like staring into the jaws of death if death was the planet on which you live um i don't know if that makes any sense but that's what it's like to me um it's again yes it is incredibly progressive um every song is a shifting chimera of like l looking into the the alien planet in uh, Tarkovsky Solaris that's ever changing and strange and shifting bite the pain Jesus fucking Christ um, this is like I think one a really great example to highlight how important the bass work is to this record and how much of a spotlight the bass gets to construct melody and pace and even solo occasionally um it, it this is it, we talked earlier that they use the bass like another instrument this is the most so in my opinion um yeah i love the bass work specifically on bite the pain it's got such an epic grandeur to it and it's thrilling there's a bass solo that's incredible um and it just this record is just full of so many instrumental risks so that they wouldn't even have like dreamed to take on another record and it's not I think symbolic is, I prefer symbolic, uh, but it's just, this is such an expansive record. They have the freedom to take those kind of risks. Um, yeah, Spirit Crusher, again, has a wonderful bass intro and it's punishing. And but I'm, I'm not gonna just go into what I like about every song because it's all great. Um, I think depending on the version you listen to, there's a cover of uh, Painkiller at the end. Uh, by oh yeah, there that, is. That's part of the original album. Okay, well, it's interesting because A Moment of Clarity feels like such a definitive full stop. Um, and then you just get their cover of Painkiller, which is, it is so much fun. Um, and Artist the vocals- fucking thing I've ever heard in yeah. my life. And the vocals are so like unique. Even this one song, the vocals are so unique in the canon of, of death because they are, it is screw he is hitting resonances of an astonishingly high pitch well um what he's doing is he is doing a fucking pitch perfect rob halford impression yeah and then uh, yeah. rob halford shows up on the final and i didn't know this either not only is rob halford in the final segment of the song that is actually kk downing on guitar as well oh wow. jesus i didn't even know that wow. either fucking <laughs> wow. That is so just, fucking amazing. That is just perfect, and it, it, I think that just goes to show how this record is like the perfect end to Death's Gravity's Rainbow. You know, and they have with Symbolic, they achieved the pinnacle of what they are capable of, and then this record is like the victory lap. I was get that is the exact song. phrasing I was going to use for this album. Couldn't oh, have said wow. it better. <laughs> Thank you, but it, it's it's incredible, and for a long time, this is my favorite until this morning um i just think it's it, it, um, it, it, it is a masterpiece what like what do you want from me you know like for me you're gonna hate me for saying this um but like if symbolic is all hell west texas this is the tallahassee where it's right next to each other in the career and they are the pinnacle of what they can do and it's yeah, incredible and I, I would and they're both in my favorite records pantheon I, well, I mean, couldn't agree more, of course. I mean, like, fucking 
<laughs> but thing is, is that it's just like, you can talk to me all day about it. It's just like, what do you think, like f- the, the difference between someone's favorite record from a band and what they consider to be their best, whether or not that's the same thing, whether or not you can deviate. But it's just like, look, in my brain, this makes sense. If you ask me like pound for pound, moment for moment, what is the most perfect death album? I, my pick is Sound of Perseverance, which, you know, I don't know if you've kicked onto the fat, but I've given a lot of these records a 10, so that's not exactly <laughs> something that means nothing. Uh, but it's just like, every time I listen to this, I am just absolutely enamored by every single moment of it. I think that, like, it's sort of, like, the the progressions and structures of the songs after their sort of first era kind of dissolved in a way is that they became so progressive that it's just like their songs became virtually structureless and they just sort of adhered to nothing other than the music. Whereas um, this, I feel, is an album that sort of calls back to their more unwieldy structure of their earlier stuff, but while still like having a a framework around it, um, which is incredible when you consider how absolutely progressive this is, which I think, again, symbolic is their actualization. This is their victory lap. And as a result, this is like, it's super proggy and it's also really indulgent. And that's the only thought like stepping stone I think people could theoretically have with this record is that it is longer, it is undeniably more indulgent than symbolic or anything else that came before it is. I mean, Death are a very lean band. They're not really like, they don't do, like they're the definition of all killer, no filler, frankly. Even they're, the albums of theirs that are the worst are just like, I don't think I'd cut a song from them. But here it's just like, yeah, this is 56 minutes and it's eight, technically nine songs once you cover the painkiller cover. And, you know, if you're more into the meat and potatoes and the more like just generally solidly structured stuff like Leprosy or even like Human, this would be an album, I can't imagine you dislike it. I imagine you'd like it, but your mileage may vary depending on what kind of progressive music you're into. All that said, um, this is exactly the kind of progressive music that I'm into, so it suits it quite fondly. And I just think that the writing on this album is perfect. I actually would say it's as good, if not better than Symbolic in moments because there is like a, it, it's, it's again, it's a very personal record in the same way that Symbolic was against he's sort of covering topics that are just very, very introspective, but also just as poetically as they were covered on the previous record. There's so many songs on here that just, they're very painfully sad and like not in a way that it's just like oh they're just sort of like reckoning with an issue that is sad it's like no that the tone of them themselves is just very dour and and like almost has a futility to it like on songs like uh flesh and the power it holds where it's sort of chuck like acknowledging the you know the prison that is the human body and how it can basically overcome and like destroy you and it's just like this is a song that really hits a lot of emotional beats for me because it's him recognizing that it's just like all these inherent limitations collapsing in on like the purest form of humanity and putting it as poetically as anybody could there's also the instrumental track on here which is voice of the soul and like bro just the fucking, the very beginning, the ba-lum-bam, 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 and then it just takes down the fucking door, and it's... it's... But, when you did it just there, it sounded like you were about to launch into, like, poker. I mean, like, look, poker. if this album did it, it would, would it just be like, I mean, that's just fucking fine, sure, you, you, you're operating at a level beyond me, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fucking take that from you, but also, important to mention that because this is, like, was this the longest between two death albums uh yes that's right okay this is the longest between two death albums and as like it can't be overstated that chuck literally sounds like a different person on this album like even if you look at symbolic and uh scream bloody gore and compare them next to each other you can still tell it's the same dude for the most part it's just like clearly his voice underwent some changes but it's like yeah it's the same guy whereas here it's just like did they get a new fucking singer because this guy's like again he's hitting rob halford levels of high notes that just like he just didn't hit before and it's fucking otherworldly and there's also just like moments of where he flexes that vocal versatility so well, like on Spirit Crusher, where he just has the spirit 
and it's fucking like how does anyone make that noise with their body that's not possible i don't know and then there's there's just a lot of like this is an album that's very very nakedly about the pain of the human experience in a way that mm. you know not any of the other albums like they they covered a bit more topics but this is very much like it, it's looking inward so much so that it's like looking past like Chuck is purely a person like it, aesthetics and and like all identifiable things removed and just like as a soul and what he thinks of like everything and there's just so much tangible sadness songs like to forgive is to suffer or um or even bite the pain it's just like there's so much going on here that it's just like this is an album that's it's definitely made by somebody who maybe had some demons that we weren't all too familiar with just because they didn't maybe show it or be honest about it but it's like there's clearly a lot going on here i think that it's pretty apparent that when chuck on earlier records was speaking about mental health or like perception, the way people can be judged. He, you know, he spoke about it with a certain amount of distance, commented on it even with like a righteousness. But here is the first time I feel like it's a man relaying his own personal experience with it. Like these are problems that he has faced head on and really hasn't approached until symbolic in this. And through the lens of this incredibly transcendent proggy opus it lends this weight that almost none of the other albums even like have in a strange way and it's like i, I don't know it's it's so ungodly perfect and i am just like whenever i listen to human and i'm like that's i i think that's my favorite i will always without hesitation throw on sound of perseverance afterwards and i'm just like okay but like is it my favorite because I don't, I don't really know, you know? And uh, it's just, there is every, it, it's, as Tyler said with Symbolic, it's like an 100 out of 100. This is an album where even, not all 10 out of 10 albums for me are albums where songs are perfect. If you've been watching our show, you know this, but this is an album, every song is perfect. Every single solitary one is a 10 out of 10. And like, I don't know, it, it just kills me that it took me like, two years to properly get into death from when I first listened to them because this is an album that is just such a fucking towering monument to all the things I love about music and the fact that it was the the final death record is like on the one hand it's just like what a way to close your career but knowing how Chuck died and knowing that he had things on the horizon that were going to be made and that I believe he had already like were they working on another album after this? So um, I was going to get into this uh, when we wrap up, but I'll touch on it now. So Chuck yeah. was working uh, with another band, his other band called a band called Control Denied, uh, yeah. and they put out a record in 1999. And the that band features a lot of the same players who perform on this record, like Shannon Ham plays on that record, uh, the guitarist on. Sound of Perseverance and Richard Christie and also Steve DiGiorgio uh, plays bass on the one record that um, Control Denied made. So I think um, Chuck was quite keen on on moving his energies towards that project. He felt that the death project had reached its, you know, its conclusion, basically. Even if it still was the last death mm -hmm. album, it's just like Chuck clearly was like the entire guy was living in his prime of course but it's just like this was a man who was probably going to be giving the world new music that was up to the level of standard of symbolic or sound of perseverance for like the next 15 to 20 years and the fact that he died in the way that he did both from a combination of a brain tumor and of pneumonia the fact that he spent his entire career decrying in like um, institutions like that of healthcare is just, it, it makes albums like this or symbolic or even human feel tainted with a inescapable tragedy of a man who was just like consumed by the very thing that he hated there at the end. And it's just like, you know, obviously his legacy is so towering that nothing could trample over that in any respect, but it's just like the, the tragedy of it all is just so fucking sad it like makes me angry There's, i mean it's like when you think about how jeff buckley died and it's just like this was this was pointless this person was literally going to be an important 
fixture in the world of art and then just wasn't because of some stupid bullshit. And like Sound of Perseverance, while I am sad that we never got another Death album or another Chuck project beyond um, Control Denied, it's also one that is so good. I am forced to not complain about it because it's like, what more could someone want than this album? Yeah, this is an art. This is the death discography is an artistically fulsome um, piece. Like, and and Chuck made <laughs> Chuck wrote and recorded all recorded all these records in his twenties. Like, fuck, man. He was Crazy. he was he was thirty four when he died, and and you just yeah. Uh, I haven't even spoken about this album yet. Um, yeah. I, I won't take too long because um, most of it's already been covered. But yeah, I I I dig how on the opening track there's um, some in some respects a bit of a lyrical throwback to earlier eras. You have this focus on flesh feasting, decay, mm-hmm. suffering that comes right out the gate, and it's almost as though Shoulder Shoulder has adapted some lyrical notes from like leprosy into arrangements yep. that are more uncompromising and unpredictable than that record could even dream of. Um, but that said, the writing on this record still contains a maturity and a depth that I think separates it from that earlier era and firmly entrenches it in late death. Though Schuldner utilizes some of the language of these earlier records, thematically, this is a much more introspective follow-up to symbolic, Chuck detailing what it means to survive and to try and live a life of fulfillment and happiness while enduring so much pain and suffering. Um, and in that respect, it becomes one of the most poignant death records. Um, true yep. to the album's ti- true to the record's title, "Bite the Pain," looks at the price of survival, of endurance, the mental fortitude to persist amongst oppressive, violent forces. Uh, the instrumental flourishes and solos here are so much flashier and more dynamic than they ever have been. Symbolic, blown up to IMAX um, projection. Yep. Um, spirit crushers and excoriation of those who speak in killing words and hide a monstrous self beneath a human ex- exterior um, belies a deep uh, mistrust of humanity. Uh, Flesh and the Power It Holds is a parable about consumerism. Uh, it's the band's longest track ever. It is truly a progressive death metal masterpiece. Um, yes. It is, a, it is a showcase for Sheldon's raw talent. Uh, the writing here is some of his best ever the riffage is beyond stellar uh, particularly the rhythmic changes tempo shifts constant adjust- adjustments within singular musical ideas such that you never hear exactly the same passage twice it, some detail of it some aspect of it if not multiple are always in flux and development yet it still feels like this one cohesive song it is an album's worth of musical ideas in eight minutes and it cannot be overstated what an achievement this track is uh, mm-hmm. voice of the soul is the only other mm-hmm. instrumental in the death discography besides cosmic sea mm-hmm. and it is beautiful beyond description uh, it features extended clean guitar as a backdrop for some absolutely spectacular soloing i was on the verge of tears listening to this this morning um a part of Sheldoner's lesson for achieving happiness is to cut sources of pain from your life completely. Um, to forgive is to suffer is the lesson. You are better off alone than in the presence of those that wish you harm or wish to use you for your own benefit. Even though this is a really dark record that does linger in the suffering of oppression, it also feels in many ways like one of the most optimistic um, death records relatively speaking yeah. like right it's right there in the title it is that um and and it, it, certainly there are points at which perseverance seems to be this kind of cynical pointless thing um but also there's equally many if not more times in which Schuldener sees perseverance as being worth it um and and as being and, and sees happiness and and contentment as being equally realistic and real and achievable things as the suffering and pain and all of that sort of thing like it's nuanced and multi-dimensional enlightenment and depravity are just two extremes of a spectrum of existence and that is Schuldner's perspective and it's quite life-affirming really (laughs) um the painkiller cover uh, is obviously pretty fucking baller um, I, I, if I have one, I'm, I'm just going to 
preface this by saying I'm going to give this record a 10 out of 10, but if I had one nitpick, it would be that it does feel strange to end a record with a cover. Mm. Um, it feels more like a bonus track, but also it, it isn't. It's kind of um, how I treat it, sort of. Yeah, I mean, I would love to treat it like one, except for the fact that it yeah. has always been the closer. I do yeah. think the record as a cohesive whole would be narrowly better if it weren't part of the album proper, but I'm glad it exists. Um, it's it's pretty fucking astonishing. Uh, and it's a great time. And in many ways, it's a real, it's an, it's a, in many ways, it's a really irreverent way to end the, the story of death. And I, I appreciate that. Like rather than ending this discography on a dour note, including mm-hmm. this cover at the very end, uh, it kind of circles back in a way to the irreverence of the early death yep. um, records and spirit. And and it, and it and it yeah, and it's and it's um, in that respect, I kind of really appreciate it. Um, yeah. And yeah, amazing album. All right. All right. Three favorite tracks, Jake. Oh, no. Christ. So this is just one of those things where it's like every single song on this album has such a singular identity that it's just like, you know, if you wanted to nitpick earlier death records and you're not exactly a trained metal listener ear, like some of that could probably run together for you. Like I can sort of imagine that if you're just not particularly savvy, you're keen on picking a lot of the really fine details up. But this is an album where that's fucking impossible every single song is itself and yet they're all cohesive so it's like yeah it's the whole album that's my favorite track but if i'm i gotta i'll say flesh and the power it holds voice of the soul and (sighs) story to tell uh, and this is fucking the most like this is like one of the top five most perfect albums I've ever heard in my life. So ten, duh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, my favorite tracks are "Flesh and Power It Holds," "To, give, to Forgive Is to Suffer," and I'm gonna say the Painkiller cover because I love it. Um, That's great. And I'm dropping a ten on the record. Oh yeah. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Spirit Crusher, Flesh and the Power It Holds, and Voice of the Soul. No least favorite track, uh, and it gets a 10 out of 10 from me. You did it. Nice. Oh, uh, fuck. Three, okay. ten, three perfect tens. <laughs> so um, one, thing we, one thing I want to do before we do our traditional album ranking and favorite songs is yeah. I want to shout out, I mean, we've kind of alluded to these um, throughout the uh episode but i want to shout out specifically for our listeners um who might be new to death the reissues of these records um particularly i think the most vital reissue uh is the human reissue which i think uh, is the biggest uh, improvement in terms of just um of an album remix absolutely listen to the um to the reissues where you can scream bloody gore that yeah, scream, well. scream bloody gore as well but yeah if, if there's a, a reissue specifically one of the 2011 uh, remixes although some were done i think su- su- uh, i think symbolics one was done a bit earlier than that but anyway the reissues are where to go i mean some purist youth fans might disagree with me there but i think unequivocally all the reissue remasters sound um uh, sound better and so Great. definitely check those out um okay um so who would yeah. like okay. go first can i because i i have to get out of here so can i go first if that's right yeah, mm. sure why not all go right first. so i my least favorite is spiritual healing unfortunately and then it's screen bloody gore individual thought patterns leprosy human sound of perseverance and symbolic and it, it's crazy that leprosy is fourth from top but that's where we are mm-hmm. and my 10 favorite death tracks i'm gonna say are flesh and power it holds uh, to forgive is to suffer uh, Crystal Mountains by a long chalk has to be on there. Uh, symbolic. Uh, anything from individual thought patterns I want. Uh, let's say uh, Nothing is Everything. So I love that song. Um, human, uh, Flattening of Emotions. Uh, Cosmic Sea, Killing Spree, uh, Leprosy, uh, Pull the Plug, and I want Evil Dead. Sick. Nice. Well done. Nice. I'll, I'll go next fuck it um my album ranking is not too dissimilar but i actually put um scream bloody gore at the bottom uh narrowly mm. i put spiritual healing above it um just because i think the virtuosity of that record is is maybe a little underappreciated as we've talked about 
Then uh, in fifth place, I have individual thought patterns. In fourth place, leprosy. And it's always this top three, and it's just a matter Man. of three. it's just a matter of ordering them. Uh, at third, I've put sound of perseverance. Second, I put human, and first, I put symbolic. Um, but yeah, that's obviously I I think symbolic is going to stay number one after the last couple of experiences I've had with it. But the rest of the list could fluctuate pretty easily. Um, and I did actually a top 15 death songs because I couldn't help myself. I mean, there's too many good ones, man. So, uh, so I'll do mine as a countdown. Uh, 15, I put perennial quest, 14, zombie ritual, 13, zero tolerance, 12, pull the plug, 11, voice of the soul, 10, trapped in a corner, nine, spiritual healing, eight, leprosy, seven, symbolic, six, lack of comprehension, uh, five flesh and the power it holds four empty words three crystal mountain two suicide machine and my number one is cosmic c fuck yeah let's go um again this is not a definitive order for me because again the three literally switch out on like an hour by hour basis um but as best i can figure uh spiritual healing at the bottom uh, right after that, Scream Bloody Gore. Right after that, um, Leprosy. After that, Individual Thought Patterns. After that, Symbolic. After that, uh, Sound of Perseverance. And after that, Human, but again. Uh, and top 10, I would say it's difficult, but um, number 10, I'm going to say Trapped in a Corner. Number nine, I will say, uh, I'll say Evil Dead. Evil Dead, after that, I'd say, um, what is that? Open Casket. Uh, seven, uh, seven, I'm gonna go with Secret Face. Six, I will go with The Philosopher. Five, I will go with flesh and the power it holds. Four, I will go with symbolic. Three, I will go with see through dreams. Two, I will go with story to tell. And one, cosmic sea. Sick. Okay. Well, if you're still with us at home, let us know what your favorite death record is. What are your favorite death uh, songs? Um, what did you think of our reviews, our discussions? Do your opinions differ in any way from us? Did we do a good job? Go um, listen, bitch. Yeah, like obviously go listen to the records, but you probably have if you're still here. Um, and yeah, stick around for some more content. We, if you are new to the channel, we release new release reviews every week and we do full discography reviews every so often. So there's plenty of content to check out. Follow us on Twitter as well at Jams T Pod. Our handles are in the description and follow us to stay updated on the latest things that we're covering and that we're doing. And yeah, that's basically it. We've done it. Rock over London, rock on Chicago goldfish the snack that smiles back